Folks, welcome to an all new episode of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this is your Tuesday episode. We're going to do a Real Housewives of Beverly Hills recap from uh, last Wednesday's episode. Uh, so this week has already started off with a bang. We did a Sunday episode because I took a couple days off last week for Thanksgiving, where we recapped last week's Salt Lake City with uh, the bonnet scene. Loving the bonnet. I'm trying to incorporate a bonnet into all of my outfits uh, in the future. So <laughs> I'm just going to collect all different colors, patterns. I I think, by the way, because listen, I Harry Styles kind of started wearing skirts last year. And I'm like, I can't like I'd love to do the skirt, but people would be saying that I would be copying Harry and Styles. But I feel like if I'm one of the first man, man, first man, I'm the first man to incorporate a bonnet into all my outfits in 2024. I think that is fashion forward. I think I could get some attention from that. So I guess I'll just be wearing bonnets from here on out. I mean, not in this recap, because uh, I only have one bonnet and it's in the wash right now, saving it for tonight's uh, live Patreon episode. How the heck are you guys doing? Yeah, so we had the Salt Lake one. We had Sophie with the Pop Culture Roundup and we had my dad, Bill Bailey, uh, which was a really heartwarming conversation. I always joke about uh, if you want to have if you're if you're nervous to have conversations with your family or friends, just start a podcast and make them talk to you on mic and you will have some of the best conversations that you could ever have. I mean, I don't even I could just, don't, you don't even have to record. Just put a mic in front of their face and say you're recording. It's just a way to actually have tough conversations. Um, and I got a lot of good feedback. And actually, my dad, my dad doesn't <laughs> I don't even think he knows really how to play podcasts, but he found a way. And uh, it was great. I had to do uh, mention it all with Dylan Hafer earlier. I think that's out today. A really fun conversation, but I got done and my dad had his AirPods in and he was like, I'm listening to me. And it was, it was very dominating the way he said it. And I was like, oh shit. And he was like, and I also listened to Sophie. And I was like, what does that even mean? And I, then I was like, did you like it? He was like, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine that he would know anything that me and Sophie were talking about. But I love that he listened to himself. But also it's one of those things like, oh man, I just don't want to reach. I hate using the word trigger, but it's one of those things when you're talking about loss and stuff. I mean, that's so intense and he listened to it back. But at the same time, what if he's like, I could start my own podcast. If he competes with me in 2024, I will take him down. I will take him down to Chinatown. You're going down, Bill Bailey. Uh, but thank you for all the kind words. And I just, uh, I, I do realize this show is all over the place. And I, I say that, I think it's in the best way, but it's kind of a mixture of everything. Like we'll talk pop culture stories. We'll do recaps. I'll tell you a lot of stuff that I'm going through. And thank you for allowing me to speak about all of it. Thanks for showing up day after day. Um, I think this is... I think this is a really good show. I hate to be uh, braggy. That's kind of not my thing, but I think it is. So thank you for, for sticking with me all this time. And I can't wait to see where we go in the future. Um, so uh, what else did I want to talk about before we started? Oh yeah, it's Cyber Monday. I've got a case of the Cyber Mondays right now. I'm not telling you guys anything that you don't know, but my I had to wake up an hour earlier today just to delete all of my emails. And it's not just emails anymore. All of these companies have your, your phone number now. So it's not just the emails. They're now texting you. Like, why do I need, I, why do I need to fucking wake up to text messages from Spanx, from Ticketmaster, from Tower Records? Tower Records went out of business, I thought. I mean, I guess brick and mortar, they have an online business. Any company that I've just, I mean, it, it doesn't, I don't even think I've purchased things from these companies companies and they're sending me uh, emails and it just, it doesn't stop. It is wild. Like, I feel like I'm missing potentially real emails because I'm just mass deleting emails. I mean, how many times, like, when are you going to take the hint? I'm not buying anything from you. My God, you should, I feel like you should opt, be able to opt out of just Cyber Monday, Thanksgiving, holidays. Oh my God. And are you guys finding this? Is it, we're now past Thanksgiving. We're we're now past Thanksgiving week. We've got Hanukkah. We've got Christmas coming up. Are, are like it's that moment where you're like, oh shit, the year's over. The year is over. I I was sending some texts and emails today of like, let's revisit, let's visit this in 2024. And I'm like, wait, we have more than a month left of the year. But are you guys like me where you're like, well, it's over. It's a throw the towel in. It's done. It's done. And it's also that moment where you're like, do I? 
try to even work out and eat right for this month? Or do I just let it slide until the new year? Like, let just like, you know what? I, I had a lot of stuffing. Do I just keep on that stuffing train until past Christmas? Because what are you going to get? You're going to get like three weeks of eating healthy. And then you're right back in that shit position of eating everything that's put in front of you. Oh, go, oh, you guys, the whoa, the whoa. I'm running through the six with my woes. Um, <laughs> that's a lot going on. Oh, my goodness. Um, so there was a lot for you guys to catch up on. Like I gave you that Sunday show. I'm going to give you this. And then uh, I think I have an interview coming out on Wednesday and then Thursday and Friday. We'll do the Salt Lake and the Beverly Hills recap from this week. And then I'll be caught up. Woo. Woo. My goodness, I'm making a lot of sounds already. That's that's annoying me. I'm so sorry, you guys. I wanted to do a couple of pop pop culture stories before I start. You guys, uh, you hear this? Uh, you hear this lady Taylor Swift? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Taylor Swift. I mean, she is dominating like nobody else has dominated in terms of pop culture. I mean, the amount of albums, the amount of touring, the amount of dating. I mean, this Travis Kelsey relationship. All of the, it, it's so much. There is a new Taylor story dropping all the time. And we woke up to one. A lot of people thought she was going to announce her reputation Taylor's version album in, uh, in Brazil or Rio, Rio de Janeiro last night, but she didn't. But we did wake up to the news that Taylor Swift's Eras Tour concert film is going to be set to stream in December, and it's going to add three additional songs. So the extra songs that are going to be added into this streaming version are Wildest Dreams, The Archer, and Long Live. So those are going to be added. This is going to come out December 13th on Video On Demand. Now, this is awesome, right? Like, great. I I never got to make it to the movie theater to see the Taylor Swift era's concert because, like I told you, she didn't put it out on Mondays and Tuesdays. She withheld it so, like, younger fans would, like, study. It's like, uh, what? What about the fucking older fans that have given up on life? Put it on Monday and Tuesdays when I can go. Anywho. My thought is, and 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 Swifties don't come for me. I I feel like I am a Swifty, but like a, a poorer Swifty. At, at two questions for the Swifties out there: How much money do you have? And second follow up question: I mean, we've got to be at the. I, it, it, this isn't a free move. Like you're going to have to pay for it again on video on demand. And then they're probably a month after that, she's going to release it on Blu-ray and all of those things. And and these fans, the really hardcore Taylor Swift fans, and it's not a small group of, I mean, there, there are millions of hardcore Taylor Swift fans. How many times are you going to keep going to these fans for money? I mean, I, by the way, and I, I, I'm positioning this in the wrong way. I don't think she's like deliberately trying to bilk all of these fans out of monies because it's a good product. But I will say with all the re-releases, like every vinyl she releases, there's like 30 different colors you can buy the vinyl in and everybody wants to have everything. Believe me, I get it. I was, I've been there. I have, I have collections of the weirdest shit. I and mean, you guys know that. I have Tom Girardi's like lingerie for the love of God. But at a certain point, when does the money run dry for the Taylor Swift fans? I mean, the concerts alone, you're looking at like $800 a ticket all of the vinyls, all of the re-releases, all of the merchandise, going to see the movie in the theaters. And now the Taylor Swift fans are going to get this video on demand. And then they're going to have to spend like probably like 50 bucks on a Blu-ray when it gets released so they can have a physical copy of this. I I, I woke up on the wrong side of the bed today, you guys. I truly did. But it, it just, I mean, do you guys ever think about like how, what, I, I need to know what's the media, like how much, are the Taylor Swift fans like how much do they make? Like they must have a good nut to spend from that they can keep up with this shit. Like how many people have gone broke following Taylor Swift at this point? I I listen. I stream all of her music on Spotify, um, and I love Taylor Swift. I read everything about her, but I've had to dip out to use a Tom Sandoval phrase on all of this other stuff. I mean, it's just wild. But I woke up to that and I'm like, that's another thing, another thing. And I just imagine really hardcore Taylor Swift fans, they're coming into Christmas time. They got to buy gifts for their families. And they're like, fuck, I guess I can't buy cousin Billy something because I need to go uh, watch this on video on demand. Or all of Taylor Swift's fans are millionaires. I, I, I need to understand this more. Oh, uh, but I did. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I slept like 
like absolute dog shit last night. I watched Real Housewives of Potomac and I didn't really love it. And then I watched Married to Medicine and I loved that. Now I knew to Married to Medicine, the Married to Medicine extended universe. And I got to say, it is really refreshing. Now I'm raw dogging Married to Medicine. I told you, I have not seen the first nine seasons of this show, but I'm like, fuck it. I'm not, I'm usually that kind of type A personality just in terms of media where I'm like, I need to watch everything from the beginning to end. And now this, I've had to give up on that notion and I'm just going to start now. So I started watching this season and I have to tell you, even without knowing all of these backstories, I'm by the fourth episode, I'm really digging it. I mean, Dr. Heavenly and sweet, I mean, they're, uh, it's just a good group. And also coming on after Potomac, I watched it after Potomac, Potomac, I feel like it is fallen so far from, I believe it's peak season, which was two seasons ago. It is like, it's one of those things that I'm going to tune in every week because those ladies are just so funny. I just think the overall storyline is lacking and we're four episodes in now. I don't give up on anything, but it is interesting when you compare it to another housewife show, like real housewives of Miami, where I watch Miami. And then I think about it during the week. I think about the actual relationships. I think about what's going on behind the scenes. I think about what's coming up this week. And I think that's always the sign of a good show, right? Is that when it keeps your attention, when it keeps your focus, when you remember what you're headed into in the next episode. And I kind of realized as a Beverly Hills, kind of a weird season this far, thus far, but I'm, I'm digging it. I'm digging the bizarreness. I'm digging once again, these relationships that are non-relationships. Like, do I think Sutton and Kyle text on a regular basis after the show wraps filming? Hell no. Do I think they all keep tabs on Erica Jane after the season ends? No, I think they, it's like being in a band. You know, I think when you're a kid, you have this false assumption that like the Beatles live together. They're like, oh, you two all shares a house, right? Like, you know, the Backstreet Boys, they all live together, right? And then you realize, oh, they all have their own lives and their own families. And then they come together on stage or in the studio. But I think we're under this false assumption or this false hope of them. Like they're an indestructible unit. They are. The Marvel Avengers, you know, and they're just not. But I, I think that's enjoyable to watch on screen, too, because you realize that these are relationships, not of convenience, but of necessity in terms to make the show. So it provides some really weird perspectives when you get into a scene with, say, Kyle and Sutton, where we start this week's episode in regards to the name them, name them. But I'm sorry, if you can't appreciate Sutton, um, you know, like uh, I said, I got a little tipsy on Thanksgiving and I drunk bought my bonnet from Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. It was like it was a drunk purchase, but it was like $14. Sutton does the same thing, but she's buying horses when she's drunk. She bought San Oh, I, I saw Santos. I had to click on it. I had to click on it. And she didn't even meet Santos until this episode, this beautiful horse Santos, which, by the way, is in the same facility that Lisa Vanderpump keeps her horse in California. Isn't that wild? Now, I mean, I need a reality show just about their horses, like Lisa Vanderpump's horse and Santos's horse. What if they're like boning each other? Like, what if there's like a whole romance going on? I mean, come on. That's my next Pixar film. Um, but I think there's enough weirdness in Beverly Hills that kind of keeps this going. Salt Lake City, my hands down favorite right now. Miami second, Beverly Hills third, Potomac fourth. Who am I? Uh, Southern Charm. That's not a housewife show. Loving Southern Charm this season. But I love when it can kind of each show can kind of have its own personality that we glom onto. I love that about these shows. Also, uh, a programming note for Bravo. If anybody from Bravo is listening had an idea <laughs> just uh, cause I am really tired. I need you to stop. I need you to stop. I'm saying this with peace and love. I'm saying this gently. I want you to stop. I want you to think about what you're doing. You're releasing too much too quickly. And I need you to take off Thanksgiving week. I need like, maybe we can do like a best of, maybe we can edit up some like what you've missed so far this season, but I need you to stop. Who, I mean, I know we're all watching these shows, but it's like Taylor Swift. You got to buy her products with Bravo. You got to watch the shows, but give us a week off during Thanksgiving. Give us a week off during Christmas. Let us be with our families. Let us not have to rush back to the television screens. I'll doubly watch Bravo the next week if you give me the week off. But it's weird to like have to like, fuck, time to make the donuts. Got to watch, got to leave my family and watch Beverly Hills. But come on. 
take a week off. And you shouldn't have released during BravoCon. I still haven't caught up from all of that. Bah humbug. God, my God, I sound like the Grinch. I'm so sorry, folks. This is, I'm, I, 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 the band-aid's off. I am in a pissy mood. I di- it was one of those sleeps, you guys, where every hour you woke up, you're like, oh. And every hour you woke up and you're like, do I, do I need to pee? And you're having that conversation when you do need to pee of like, can I fall back asleep immediately so I don't have to get up and pee? Can and you're, 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 It's that quick thought. Do you guys do that? Were you, <laughs> hey guys, how's your prostate doing? No, but it's one of those things now where you're like, you'll wake up and you'll be like, I have to pee, but you don't want to get out of bed. So you're trying to fall back asleep immediately. Oh, what else is pissing me off? Oh, this TikTok. Oh, this old talk of tick. This TikTok, you guys. I couldn't fall asleep after married to medicine. So I uh, flip on the old TikTok. All of a sudden, an hour and a half passes. I could have sworn it was five minutes. And I'm not telling you I was enjoying myself. I'm just like flipping story, 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 story. And then an hour and a half goes by and then I'm livid. I'm who do I bill for that hour and a half of my life? My God. That's that's that is now that is crack cocaine. That is that that is a that's substance abuse right there. That is horrible. I mean, TikTok really should put a warning up there when you get like 10 minutes into this of like, are you sure you want to keep going? Oh, goodness. God, that's what if I start getting Cyber Monday emails from TikTok, my head's going to explode. Um, before I get into this, uh, Beverly Hills recap, I talked about Taylor Swift. I also, there was this thing on Twitter. I, I meant to bring this up with Sophie on Monday and I wish she was here again today to talk about this, but there was this great tweet over the weekend and it was talking about previous, um, previous celebrity relationships that lasted like a brief moment or two that we've kind of forgotten, but a lot, you know, like there's one celebrity relationship that you always like. I know that happened, but we've kind of all collectively forgotten about it, but I can't stop thinking about it. Um, oh, this is the this is the tweet. That one random celeb relationship that everyone moved on from, but you literally can't forget it and think about it every day. Now think about this. You're all pop culture experts. Think about what that relationship was for you. Now I had 30 that sprung into my mind immediately. And so many people posted so many good ones. I want to do this as a recurring segment on this show because there are so many relationships that we could talk about, but here were mine that I immediately thought of when I read this tweet. And I, uh, if you guys don't know about this, don't let it shock you. Mine was one of them was Jack, Jack's Taylor and uh, Ramona Singer. Now, Tom Sandoval on a podcast a while back said that Jax did sleep with Ramona Singer. Now, this is a long time ago when uh, Real Housewives of uh, New York, when she was still on that, Bethany was on that. And there are a handful of pictures of Jax and Ramona Singer. And I posted one on my uh, Twitter, but it's one of those relationships. Like, how does that even work? Like Jax back in the day probably would have slept with anything that wasn't nailed down. But how do you sleep with Ramona Singer? and? I mean, that's the only, <laughs> that's one of the only reasons I would have Jax Taylor on if he would ever admit, like he, if he would ever just go, if I could just be like, what was it like? What was she like? Tell me everything. Tell me, every, do you like, is, is Ramona a gentle lover? Is she giving? Is she, don't, don't make that face. You guys, these are serious questions that I have. Also, do you guys remember Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy, Jim Carrey and Jenny McCarthy, they dated for years. I completely forgot about that. Um, let's see some other ones. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie. Remember that relationship? Uh, this is before Brad Pitt, obviously, but Billy Bob Thornton, the actor, um, they used to carry vials of their own blood of each other's blood on their, on their chest. And they would show up to movie premieres. I'm thinking of gone in 60 seconds, the Nicolas Cage movie. They showed up to this movie premiere. I remember this so like it was yesterday And they would just uncomfortably make out like Kourtney Kardashian and Travis Barker do on a daily basis in front of people. But they were the original Kourtney uh, Kardashian and Travis Barker. They would pretty much finger bang each other on the red carpet. And it was one of those things where Billy Bob Thornton, Billy Bob Thornton, amazing actor. But, you know, he did this movie called Sling Blade and that kind of put him on the map. But in Sling Blade, he was like 50 pounds heavier And there's like this thing when you kind of get a little like shine for your work, you immediately get like 
celebrity pills where it makes you like lose weight immediately. Your skin clears up. You're able to grow like a cool mustache or grow out your hair. It's like magic. It's weird. It's why it's, it's something that I think about all the time is trying to get to a place where I can get these celebrity pills. Um, but I remember that they would just maul each other any chance they got. And Angelina Jolie would be like, I want to be inside him. Like that would be, she'd be on the red carpet and she'd be like, I'm just thinking about being inside of Billy Bob Thornton right now. Um, but everybody has this relationship. I mean, Lenny Kravitz and Nicole Kidman. I mean, think about it. Macaulay Culkin from Home Alone. Uh, remember he, he, um, he was with Mila Kunis for years. I mean, that was for a year long relationship. I mean, Julia Roberts in the country singer Lyle Lovett, of course, a huge one. You have Justin Beamer and Selena Gomez, which I don't think is forgotten. I think people still think about that every fucking day of their lives. I mean, it's true. People have made a cottage industry on still talking about that relationship. I mean, Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart from Tr Twilight. Remember that? And then Kristen Stewart got caught cheating with the movie director of, what was it, uh, The Huntsman? The was it Charlize Theron movie? He was and, and he was married at the time and they got photographed making out and that broke up that relationship. And now Kristen Stewart is, I think, married to a woman, if I'm not mistaken. Um, FK Twigs, the singer and Robert Pattinson. I mean, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. I mean, they were married for the love of God. That's a fascinating relationship, too. This is another pop culture relationship uh, moment that like was burned into my memory. So Angelina Jolie, after the Billy Bob Thornton stuff, Billy, uh, sorry, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt did Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that movie, right? About spies. Now, they weren't together, but there was all these rumblings, even though Brad Pitt was married to Jennifer Aniston. There was all these rumblings. Obviously, something was going on. But then Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt announced their divorce. But right before they did that, they went on a trip. I don't know if it was like to Cabo or Mexico, but there are these paparazzi photos of them walking on the beach. And it was always like, and they're like, their, their arms were around each other. And it was this kind of, it was almost positioned as if I'm remembering correctly, kind of like this, we ended this relationship on our ter terms, but it almost kind of struck me as Brad Pitt, almost trying to manipulate the situation in a way of, I just wonder what the real story is with that. Like, did he go in there and go like, listen, I'll always love you. But I think our, like he almost tried to do it in this friendly way and convince her it was both of their choices. Right. And then, then him and Angelina Jolie picked up officially with their relationship. But that to me was always fascinating because, you know, I'm a student of us weekly. And so this is, and some of these relationships are before the internet was as powerful as it is now. And then you want to speak about Jennifer Anderson. Remember the multi year long relationship with, with, uh, with John Mayer. I mean, John Mayer, we just talked about John on uh, Monday's show with Sophie, but that was a full-blown relationship as well. I mean, God, John Mayer, what about the Katy Perry years? I mean, it is a six degrees of Kevin Bacon when it comes to celebrity relationships, but how many relationships have you forgotten? It's almost like this Mandela effect where you're like, did that relationship actually happen? Because life moves on, right? We all have dated multiple people and thank God nobody writes articles about that. But think about that. Who are those people for you? Who are those relationships for you? I mean, Chelsea Handler, remember when she was dating 50 Cent? Yeah, money by Monday, Randall, and money by Tuesday, Chelsea. That was a relationship. Um, uh, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, remember that relationship? <laughs> uh I'm trying to let's see. I'm just looking at Courtney Love. Okay, this is one that I posted. Courtney Love, obviously the lead singer of Hole, rock icon, also the previous wife of Kurt Cobain from Nirvana, rest in peace. After Kurt Cobain, one of the people she dated, now there was a couple people she had like flirtations with, or there was rumors about Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins. You had Evan Dando from the Lemonheads, I believe that singer. And then... This one always blew me away. Edward Norton, the actor Edward Norton. They were in a multi-year relationship where they actually took couples pictures with Frances Bean, her daughter, with Kurt. And Courtney Love still goes on record to this day that he was just an amazing boyfriend. But that was always wild because it was when Edward Norton was doing the movie American History X around that time. Um, so I, I, and, and Courtney Love, remember Courtney Love for a, a hot minute, she was really positioned as 
going to be like the next breakout in terms of actors because she did this movie called The People versus Larry Flint that had a lot of, uh, I think I believe got a couple Oscar nominations. Woody Harrelson got a nomination. Uh, I thought it was a great movie, but she was, I think, Althea. Althea! Sorry, I'm doing a bad Woody Harrelson impersonation, impersonation from that movie. Also, I realize I'm just like spitting out facts and you guys might not. Are, is anybody keeping up with me? Uh, this is like a beautiful mind for useless facts right now. But uh, yeah, Courtney Love was in that movie and did a bang up job. And I thought, wow, she is really like gone from the band whole, which I still think Celebrity Skin is one of the, me- the best album. I love that that album, Celebrity Skin. Um because you had the song Malibu on that, man, make me over. Anyways, what happened to Courtney Love trying to be an actor? I thought she was fantastic. Anyways, I think I'm going to keep talking about this topic. If you guys like this topic, let me know, or just email me your thoughts. So bad. It's good with Ryan Bailey at gmail.com. Let me know your, uh, your celebrity relationships that we have forgotten because it is a tangled web that Hollywood weaves. And I think it is worth mentioning and remembering as we come into the holidays of relationships past. I mean, you could do a whole episode just on previous Taylor Swift relationships. Uh, If Taylor did it though, we'd have to pay for it. She would charge you to talk about it. JK, I love you, Taylor. I really do love you, Taylor. Okay, moving on. Also, man, I feel like a schmuck right now and trigger warning. I'm going to talk about uh, miscarriage. Um, I, uh, I just texted Kristen Doty because I was on her podcast last week recapping a, a Vanderpump Rules episode with her, um, which which go listen. But I, I I texted her. I was like, hey, was there positive feedback? Did I screw it up? But, uh, you know, just making sure. And she was like, no, everything's great. And then I went to her page and I saw she just released a podcast yesterday uh, that her and her guy Luke suffered a miscarriage and I just had to text her back and I'm like, I am so, so sorry. I just saw that you had posted this and I, I had no clue when I texted her about like, Hey, was I okay? Oh, you guys, man, the world is so tough. Sometimes my heart goes out to them and to anyone that, that that's happened to. Uh, it's so just so horrible. So, uh, thinking about them, put a good thought out there for them. Uh, if you, if you can, Whew. Okay. Let's get to some fun stuff. Let's get to some, have we forgotten about laughter folks? Now I want to uh, make the warning as I usually do. If you are a housewife and if you're especially a Beverly Hills housewife, don't listen to this podcast. You are bound to get upset by something that I say. And also remember, even though I think at the end of the day, we have now come to the conclusion that I am always right. It's okay to have differences of opinions, and I am saying some of these things out of pure silliness. So there is no reason to crash your car, to throw your phone out, to um, to do to do any of those things. Uh, I am a sad, sad man. So at the end of the day, just chalk it up to that. If there is anything that you disagree with me saying, now I do think I have a couple of opinions that might be different than other people's opinions. Now, I've read a lot of discourse online about Sutton and her drinking because, um, what's her name? Freddie Freddie Mellencamp, um, (laughs) the daughter of Bruce Springsteen, um, she said on Watch What Happens Live with uh, Kyle that uh, Sutton keeps a bottle of vodka in her purse, which is like, I don't know, man. Um, and of course, we do see Sutton imbibing on the show. They've done they did an editor troll where the dog the dogs were watching her have a 1 p.m. cocktail. And I said this and I still agree, you know, listen, if I was getting three hundred and sixty thousand dollars from my ex tax free every month, I would probably imbibe a little earlier in the day. Oh, my God. You know, what's so weird, you guys. And it's sad. I mean, it's it's genuinely sad and it's sad that I care. I. uh I'm not really drinking like, I mean, I was never a heavy drinker, but when I would drink, I would go hard, but it's just not hitting the same. Isn't that, isn't that sad? You're like, it's not taking me away the way that it used to. And even over Thanksgiving, 
like we had a bunch of wine, but it wasn't like crazy. I'm like, I'm, it was, and then like, you know, we didn't really drink at all the rest of the weekend. And I think, you know, I think it was my mom. She was always pushing the, the wine on me every night because my mom would have this big glass, like this goblet of red wine. She had a very specific uh, bottle of, uh, was it Malbec or something? It was like, she would buy it by the case from Costco. And it was always her table wine. And she'd be like, I just have one glass. But the glass was like a thirst buster, you guys. The glass was a thirst buster. And if I was visiting and I didn't have a goblet with her, she'd be like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I won't have one then. I'm like, no, I'll have I'll have a goblet of wine with you. But it, it was one of those things I was, I was just like, oh, that's so sad. I'm not even enjoying like a martini like I used to. Um, it, it was, it, it's one of, is that growing up or is that just my body giving out? <laughs> but Sutton, the been oh, she's drunk. She's drunk. Yeah, probably. But it doesn't take away from the fact that something's going on with Kyle and I'm sorry, Kyle. And I do, I do encourage life changes like working out obsessively, not drinking, eating right. All of these things are amazing when you look at them on the surface, like amazing. But what it is doing, and especially when you put yourself on TV, is that it it kind of almost brings some of the anger that you feel in your own life to the surface. Some of that stuff that you might have might have kept under the surface with drinking or certain types of behavior. And so I don't know if you guys see this as well. Kyle seems a little bit more like where it used to be like fun kind of mean. Now it's like snarky mean and it's kind of mean mean. And I do hold true to the fact that she picks on, uh, she picks on Sutton. She thinks she's better than Sutton. And I think a lot of this women on the cast feel that they are better than Sutton. Yes. I do love Sutton as a character. I do love her as a character. I still love her as a character. She's one of those people to me, like Lisa Barlow, that is unapologetically herself. Would I do half of the things that she does with a camera in front of my face? Hell to the no. Am I thankful that she does it because I think it makes good TV? Hell to the yes. I mean, completely. I, we all watch these shows in different sorts of way and uh, sorts of ways. Now I, I do appreciate certain storylines and I even appreciate Garcelle with her movie talking about a very serious topic. In fact, I visited the website, which we will talk about on this about missing black women in, uh, you know, in America. I mean, there's a great website. I, I urge everybody to go to, to really check out the cause about, uh, what her movie speaks about. And so it's great. Cause it actually, the show can introduce like interesting topics like that, but also the show works as a very, very, very dark comedy. And I think the sudden thing is always easy to pick at because she is, I mean, there are so many targets with her. She says so many batshit crazy things. I mean, she wore pants to get humped on at a magic Mike show and that got bummed. She didn't get humped on, but to me, that was relatable to me. That was relatable. And in a way sad, cause she just wanted to get her hump on. And she, you know, she almost had to face that within herself of like, no, I didn't wear no pants because I wanted to get humped on because I wanted to get spanked face work, uh, all sex on stage. No, it's filthy. It's disgusting. I, I'm on the board of a ballet company. I say, I say, but if you look at the subtext underneath that, I think it's really fascinating. And I think we need characters like that. that aren't strategically playing the game of housewives. And at the end of the day, if we want to believe it or not, Sutton is right. What's going on with you, Kyle? What's going on with you, Kyle? Kyle, no, South Park, what's going on with you, Kyle? What's going on? And Kyle can like bitch and moan all she wants, but Sutton nails it. There is something going on with Kyle. It's okay to have something going on. It's okay to change your life and have it completely change all of these different facets of your life. But you've got to be honest with it. And Kyle, Kyle has been there since day one on this show. I mean, she is OG, OG, but she has never been good at the front position. She's never been good at the story being completely revolving around her. I don't think she likes it. I don't think she necessarily works in the shadow, but she's always kind of been that middle of the road person. So I think when a spotlight really gets on her, and I think you, you can't help but have a spotlight on her this season among any of the other seasons, because all of these huge changes, it's not weird to think that like, what's going on with you, Kyle? 
Because that's an honest, honest question that everybody in her life, her family, her friends have probably asked. Am I, am I, am I losing my, I feel like I'm going crazy. Like that's an honest question. I mean, Sutton might have like, you know, I mean, there might be underpinnings behind it, but it's an honest question. Like Sutton, from my understanding, has been the same these last four seasons. She's been the kind of weird one that said, I mean, listen, one of the first scenes with Sutton was telling Teddy of like, oh, you just cry about everything. You ain't that. I didn't think you ain't it, really that interesting anyways. Remember the dinner table and she made Freddie Mellencamp cry within the first two minutes of the, the, the dinner? Like she's always said shit like this. So Sutton has remained the same for better or worse. But Kyle has outwardly changed so intensely that you would have people asking about it. And if you are on a reality show based on your life, you are going to need to talk about it. Now, this is one of those things. I do not miss Lisa Rinna, but I do miss the character. And I hope one of these other ladies can step up and maybe it is Sutton to go own it, own it, own it. It's me, Lisa Rinna. I'm eating Harry's, Harry's Bolognese. I'm on a very long extended break from working in TV and film. <laughs> I was just on American Horror Story, but I, I, I don't want to be back on Housewives, I swear. <laughs> you miss that character that says, own it, because own it. Step into it. Kyle, at some point this season, and I'm sure we do see it, will have to be like, yes, I am fucking changing. Now, Kathy Hilton and Paris Hilton are on like a press tour right now because... Uh, what is it called? Uh, Paris and Love or I Love Paris. Season two it premieres on Peacock where Paris uh, gives Kathy the surprise of a lifetime and says, hey, I'm pregnant. No, actually, the baby's already born and it's here. Like Kathy finds out supposedly on the TV show, as well as Paris Hilton's sister Nikki finds out on the show. I am all in on the second season of that show. Um, But. <laughs> Kyle's going to have to talk about it. Kyle's going to have to talk about what's going on. But what I, sorry, what I meant to say was Kathy was, is on this press tour right now. And she just said in an interview, somebody asked her about Kyle and Mauricio and Kathy very diplomatically said, yeah, I don't think they're getting back together. I don't think Kyle would take it this far if she had planned on getting back together. And it's exactly what I've been saying the last couple of months. They are not going to get back together. You don't go this far. You don't let it hit public. And remember now it's been so long since that people magazine first came up out about the separation. And then they pushed back on that article and people, but it's been so long that we've now gotten used to the idea. So it's the gentlest way to break off the pop culture bandaid for us to get used to the idea of Kyle and Mauricio not being together. It's kind of genius if you think about it, because that air, that people magazine article came out so much, you know, a long time ago before this season even aired. So we are now caught up to the idea. So they have had to not deal with it all at once. Now they're dealing with it in like phases. And now the show is out. And we get to see what the how the show presents it. And already from the first First episode with love bean stop getting the tattoos love bean it's enough love bean no no more tattoos don't 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 tattoo your face love bean please like we've seen it now episode after episode that we know that this show is telling that specific story i think some of us were under the false auspices that we were going to um we were going to get this story later in the season or all of a sudden it was going to be this weird thing of like wait kyle and mauricio no from episode one this is the story that they've been telling and we're going to watch this. And I find it fascinating just because Kyle has been there from day one. We are, even if you say you aren't, we are invested in her story, whether you want to believe that or not. We do want to see how all this breaks down. And in next week's episode, not only do we get the uh, the introduction of Anne-Marie Wiley, the new character, which the new housewife who's on the posters, how do you introduce somebody that's on the posters in the sixth episode, which whatever, I, I find her very troubling and she hasn't even set foot on screen yet. I, and also she was very like, God, didn't she, she at the Beverly Hills panel at BravoCon, she was like talking like she was an OG regular. It was like, girl, we don't even know you yet. Like let up, uh, let the other women talk. And her husband, oh, I don't know if you guys read about her husband last week, but look into it if you haven't. Um, so I think uh, I, I, I'm curious how this show is going to present all of this, but we're kind of slowly seeing. And so, like I said, Amory gets introduced this this week's episode, but also we get the introduction of Morgan Wade. Kyle's very special country singer friend. I'm Morgan Wade. I'm Morgan. She stalked me. She stalked me. 
So we get to see Morgan finally and see that relationship. And what I bet, this is a prediction, I bet Kyle lights the fuck up like a Christmas tree when Morgan gets introduced on this show. You know, that's and I'm not saying they have a, a full blown relationship, but obviously it's a relationship, even a friendship. It's that kind of friendship that when they shine your light on you, you feel really special. And I think Morgan, that relationship makes Kyle feel really special, really, really special. And we all want that, right? There's no shame in that. But also a 27 year marriage. Is that really going to shine the light that you might need at this point in your life on you? A 27 year marriage. I mean, you're. You're so used to each other and you've built something so amazing, but I don't know. I'm curious if these are going to be lost years for Kyle of like, there was this story. Remember, um, oh, this is so off topic, but John Lennon, when he was with Yoko, him and Yoko Ono broke up and he has this thing. It's called like, what was it? They, they like the lost, the lost weekend or the lost weeks where him and uh, Harry Nilsson, the old singer songwriter who's passed away, they, John Lennon and Harry Nelson were just like drinking like fishes at like the Troubadour, all these places, just causing a ruckus. And John Lennon was with a bunch of other different women during this break from Yoko Ono. And I'm really curious if this is going to be like a year to two year long break and down the line, they will get back together or it is done, done. I'm leaning towards done, done. But you never know, like, you know, you could, something can be so exciting to you for a period of time and be everything that you need in that moment. And then you wake up to the fact a year later, like, oh, my God, my life, what did I do to it? You know, like it's like, you know, pressurizing from space where you're like, OK, I can breathe again. I'm starting to think normally again. Oh, my God, what did I do? My life is like like completely different than it was a year ago. That can be really exciting at first. It can be everything that you need. But humans are we're weird creatures. We will then go back and be like, oh, my God, Macaulay Culkin home alone face. What? Zoinks. What did I do? I'm so curious how this plays out. And my hope, even though if I was a real person, I would fight against it. I hope they put all of this on screen because I think it's fascinating. I think this is something that we haven't necessarily tackled in terms of housewives. This long of a relationship for somebody that's been there since season one. I really am so curious how production puts this all together. So that is something that I'm thinking about nonstop. Okay, folks, uh, let's finally get into, whew, let's get into the recap, you guys. Oh my gosh, uh, I've been breaking this up today. So I did uh, mention it all with Dylan Hafer earlier. That should be out today. And then I just guessed it on uh, um, this uh, podcast. They just rebranded Leon uh, called Everyone is Lovely which was a lot of fun, but I am on my last legs and I still got to do this recap and then do the Patreon later. So I have got to get some energy. So let's get into this so I can scream and yell and find the energy from screaming and yelling about these women. Uh, a huge thank you as always to Juliana Carosa who took these notes. She's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Especially during Thanksgiving week. This is just huge. Uh, we got to catch up here. So this one is called suddenly suspicious. Oh, you guys working overtime over there at Evolution Media suddenly. So it's like suddenly, suddenly. I got what you do. Suddenly suspicious. I wonder if Sutton saw that and was like, woo, they, they they put my name in the title. Santos, Santos, come here, horsey. They, <laughs> you're a beautiful horse. They named your mama Sutton in the title for this week's episode. This is the summary. Still reeling from their tense exchange, Sutton isn't horsing around. <laughs> This is the description. Sutton isn't horsing around when she brings up rumors about Kyle's marriage. You Sutton isn't horsing around. I love how silly you guys are with the description. I love it. So previously on Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, we have all of the scenes thus far. You know, we have Erica with her therapist from the first episode of like, I was married to one of the most unsupportive humans, probably. And then Tom being a dad and the therapist is like, it's such a terrible fall from grace. And then we have Wally's where Dorit is lightly picking at her tuna sandwich. It's like, I told you, Kyle, this was not a good year for my marriage. I know you've said that. And Kyle's like, Mo, you know, there's a lot of business events where I'm supposed to go to. And sometimes it's like, I don't want to go to these parties. Kyle in a talking head going, 
I think the way that my relationship is now, I'm not happy. Don't we know? Hey, the tattoos tell a story. And then we have, of course, the Vegas scenes where uh, Erica lets us know that she gave up fighting for Lint as a good Catholic. And then, of course, the Magic Mike show where we're doing pantomiming, going down on women as art. You know, the Magic Mike show is an art form, you guys, for Crystal's birthday. And son's like, well, I'm very uncomfortable with that whole thing. Take my mic off. I own a ballet company. And then we have the sprinter ride to the airport where Kyle yells, we weren't going to leave you because you seemed unhinged about Sutton. And then we have Sutton's house after Vegas, the scene last, you know, last episode, which was iconic where Kyle was like, how are you feeling after Vegas? And Sutton like, well, it wasn't my favorite departure. I love that. She still, she speaks like a Tennessee Williams play. Well, I just have a mint julep here, Kyle. It wasn't my favorite departure. And then Kyle's like, you have a habit of losing your shit and ridiculous circumstances too. And Sutton lowers her chin and glares at Kyle with that sudden look like, Whoa. Sutton would be a great silent film star. And this is where we started in what I think is shaping up to be one of the most amazing scenes of 2023. It's a late entry, but it's really good. Sutton's like, hey, mom. That what? Name mom. Well, name mom. Well, what you did was ridiculous. Name them. And then Sutton points her finger at the table. Name them. Well, be quiet. Name them. Well, let me talk, Jesus. And this is where the show picks up this week. We left right off at Sutton's house. Sutton gives the Kyle the old up and down look and smirks and then points at the table again. Name them. And Kyle pauses in disbelief. Not sure what she is. This an apparition? What is she seeing here? And Sutton again. Name them. And Kyle's like, I don't know if you're okay, actually. Name them. Are you okay? Name them. Stop doing that. You're being incredibly, incredibly rude. And Sutton, very calmly, I'm just asking you to name them. Well, be quiet and I will, please. Sutton bugs her eyes, bug eyes. And Kyle's like, when you didn't have a gift at Lisa Rinna's house, and then you had to say your ugly leather pants, you lost your shit there. And of course, we flash back to those scenes of like, jealous of what? Your ugly leather pants? And Garcelle's like, oh. And then Kyle goes, you lost your shit also in Lake Tahoe. We flash back to 2020 in Lake Tahoe with Sutton to Crystal. Well, I was going to leave this morning, seriously, as she's maniacally rolling that purple face roller all over her face. And she's like... This helps me rolling this face thing over my face. She doesn't need the face roller anymore because now she has Santos. I got rid of my purple face roller because I have Santos to calm me down. Why Why can't we just let Santos live at her house? Like the technology should be should be able to be there where I feel like she should be able to put a stable in her backyard. I'm not a horse owner, so I don't know. It just feels like if we can have electronic V, like if we can have EVs now where you plug it in, I feel like we should be able to have a stable. The technology is there. And then Kyle's like, you lost your shit at the show. You did not seem okay in Vegas, Sutton. And you don't seem okay now, frankly. And Sutton stares at Kyle defiantly, blinks her eyes. And Sutton's like, well, I feel like your reaction. And Kyle's like, I am. I'm heated now because... And then Sutton throws her hands towards Kyle. You seem unhinged. Kyle frowns at her. By the way, I want Sutton to be in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I feel like she would make such a good, like, character. Just, I mean, she's like with her hand movements and her face. God, this is just iconic. Kyle and I talking heads like, everyone says Sutton's kooky. But this isn't kooky. This is just flat out bizarre. But also, like what I've been saying, Kyle's behavior is bizarre. It's just not outwardly bizarre. But Sutton is always known for being outwardly bizarre. Kyle circles her hands in the air. What's going on? Sutton pauses, then circles her hand in the air back. Well, there's nothing going on, I say. I say, there's nothing going on. What's going on with you? Kyle's like, what's going on with me? I don't know. Well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Sutton could be a witch. I mean, these are a lot of witch movements. I mean, if we're just going to like Hocus Pocus, those kind of witch movies, Sutton is doing witch movements. Sutton and I talking heads like, well, what's going on in your life, Kyle? Because you never talk about you. Your life is perfect. I say, I say, you live in a fortress on top of a very, very high pedestal. 
I was thinking about the dynamics of that. If you live in a fortress, do you need to live in a pedestal in the fortress? Because the fortress would protect you. So why live in on a pedestal in, I don't know. It just didn't make sense to me. Anyways, Kyle shakes her head. It's like, bring it on, babe. I'm answered to, I'm, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Well, I got some, Kyle, what if something's like, do you like going down on women? I say, I say, anyways, something's like, well, I'm not bringing it on. I love the name dropping of the movie, potentially bring it on. It's been rotten. Kyle stands up. It's like, okay, I hope you're well. And something's like, well, I am well. And Kyle walks away and I do love you. And we'll talk another time. And Kyle now is running away from her own reality. I do feel like housewives should be fined $10,000 if they premature leave a scene. If they premature evacuate, they should be fined $10,000 because Kyle should not be able to leave like that. But it just goes to show you she was there all of like 20 minutes, but they got what they needed to get. They got an iconic scene out of it. Like, I feel like Kyle's like, well, we did our job. I'm out. Kyle and a talking head's like, Sutton's out of her mind right now. I just feel like I need to get out of here before I get to the point of no return. Get to the point of no return, Kyle. This is where we go to the point of no return. It's Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Also, that's gaslighting Sutton. That's gaslighting a little bit. Like, oh, all of a sudden Sutton's crazy. <laughs> Kyle's behavior is a little kooky. Why can't we call on that? I don't know. I, I know I'm defensive for Sutton. I know that. I get it. And also, I do believe Sutton was probably tipsy. I do believe that. But two things can be true at once. Anyway, Sutton gets up and says, well, I'll walk you out. And Kyle's like, I'm good. And Sutton opens her door and goes, bye. It's rainy, by the way. It's rainy outside. It's, it's really just a very mysterious scene. And a new day, we fly across town to the back of Erica Jane's house. I mean, pool house. I've missed this shot. I said, where is this shot? We finally got this shot where they don't shoot Erica's house from the front. Um, and I've been on her street. So, you know, it's, it's a great looking house, but it's just not, you know, from the front, it's not camera. But I'd love that they get it from the back of what looks like a dingy pool house. And the pool is dirty, if you notice in this. And Eric is making a phone call. She's like, hey, are you in the car? And it's her, her mom, Renee. And Renee's like, uh-huh, we're passing the C's candy, if you know what that is. Erica looks dumbfounded like she doesn't know what a C's candy is. And Renee's like, I have three bags. Three bags? Well, I have a carry-on. Um, and Eric's like, oh, all right. Well, I was wondering how long you planning on staying. And Renee, her mom, pauses. Well, for a couple years. And then Erica goes, bitch, huh, that is shady as fuck. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. I'm Erica Jane. Can we talk about, like, did Erica not pick her mom up at the airport? <laughs> yeah, you can find your way. LAX. It's called Uber, Renee. Like, that's her mom. <laughs> she didn't pick her mom up from the airport. I don't know. I'm sorry. Come on, man. Pick your mom up from the airport. Eric and I talking heads like, my mother and I have had our good times and our bad times. And yes, there have been times I didn't want to talk to my mom. We see the car arriving. Renee gets out. Erica goes to help her with her luggage. And Erica continues in a talking head. She visits me in L.A. about once a year for a couple of days. Then we start getting on each other's nerves. Eric and Renee hug hello. And Eric's like, how are you? Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Kind of just like, <laughs> you know what? Just like a, like it's just very kind of like a trick or treater comes by, I'm like, oh, don't you look cute in that Spider Man outfit? Okay, here's your candy. Move on. But, anyways, Renee's like, I'm good, of course. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, mommy. I love you. Sorry, sorry I didn't pick your ass up from the airport. Eric and the talking head's like, my mother and I are very close in age. <laughs> and a lot of times growing up, she felt like a sibling instead of a parent. And then Erica tells her mom, you're slim. What's going on with you? And Renee's like, you're slim. What? <laughs> I discovered hormones. It's hormones. No matter what you want to say, mom, it's hormones. Anyways, Erica, go, Erica goes, the last time, remember, you told me I was fat? <laughs> the last time you were here? And Renee's like, yeah, I did. I did call you fat. <laughs> well, maybe now I know why she didn't get picked up from the airport. Erica continues in a talking head. We had a good fucking time, she and I. I would sneak around and go clubbing with her and her friends. I'd have a drink. I was acting like I was 20. And I was 14, 15. It's kind of how I imagine Northwest and Kim Kardashian's relationship's going to be in the future. Erica goes, you have a choice, Renee. 
I set you up in my room, and now I can either sleep on the sofa, I have a futon, I can sleep on the floor. Renee's like, no, nah, I don't want you doing any of that. Well, I can sleep with you. Renee's like, you can sleep with me. Eric and the talking head's like, at the old place. Tom's mansion. She can be on the other side of the house. I don't have to deal with her. Here, she's, we're sleeping in the same fucking bed. I don't want to do this. I'm grown. I don't want to do this. <laughs> Fudge college, mom. <laughs> but by the way, I like this version of Erica Jane where she has to cosplay like, you know, like she's poor, like, you know, Superman lost their powers and her power was being rich. And now she has to live like the rest of us. Of Like how many conversations like this have we had with our families of like, okay, I'll sleep on the couch. You sleep in the bed. I like this, but I do love that it's so out in the open of what a hassle this is for Erica. Oh my God. This is such like, let her mom stay with Mikey Minden then. My God, bitch and moan. Sutton will take her in. Anyways, they take Renee's luggage down to Erica's room and Erica's like, what are we doing with all this shit? It's so tight here already. <laughs> I have all this shit I stole from Tom's. I'm going to put y'all three pieces of luggage in here. Bullshit. And we end the scene with a nice shot of the back of Erica's pool house. Uh, we Go to the next scene, and it's just Garcelle and her son, Jade. Jade is cooking like a steak dinner. Great. Uh, and Garcelle is once again talking about her relationship with her sons. And she says her son, Jade, is it's kind of like, it's a little bit like he's her boyfriend because he's so protective. He doesn't like drama. And it's just an easier relationship than her relationship with Jax, who we've seen in the first episode of the season where Jax thinks he is all grown up now and he does not need any more parenting, which is just a laughable notion. But it is that notion that I think we've all been through as young adults when we're like, I'm a grown man or woman now. You can't tell me I'm 15 years old. I know how to live properly as an adult. It's kind of just funny because we've all been there and we realize how wrong we are. But but it's like just awkward because this is on television and we know Jax will get to a point where he's like, oh my God, I was so wrong. I, you know, I need mothering for the rest of my life. Anyways, they flash back to that scene where Jax is like, there were times, mom, I think I needed more than you were giving me in terms of parenting. But as of now, I feel that I don't need much more parenting anymore. Garcelle should have been like, peace. See you in a couple of years. Garcelle in the talking head says, I feel like part of the reason why I want my boys to express themselves to me is because I couldn't express myself to my mother. And although I'm their parent, I also want to have a relationship with them and not just be a parent. Ah, oh, it's the hardest job, she says, and rolls her eyes. And it doesn't end. I mean, it truly doesn't. I do think about that in terms of the mothers and, of course, the fathers out there of just it doesn't end. It doesn't end. The moment you have that child, in most cases, they are yours until the end. And you will always worry about them. You will always wait up for them. You will always, oh my God. And they can probably hurt you the most as well. But Garcelle admits to Jay that, you know, Jax did hurt her feelings. And, you know, and Jade's like, really? Why? Well, you know, he says he wants more freedom. And then Garcelle's like, do you want more freedom, Jade? And he doesn't answer. And Garcelle's like, well, you don't really go outside. And then he's like, um, yeah. I think I do want a little bit more freedom. I'd like Ashlyn to sleep over because Ashlyn was that girl he's all hot and bothered for that we found out in the first episode. And that's the other thing that, that concept. Remember that when you had your first girlfriend or boyfriend and then you're like, why can't he or she sleep over? We'd be good. We would not be dry humping. I swear to God, there's no dry humping happening. Are you kidding me? I will not wet the bed if Ashlyn's here. Uh, anyways, Garcelle's like, no way. There's no way Ashlyn's sleeping over here. Uh, and Garcelle's like, first of all, her mom would never allow it. And Jade's like, that's a fact. And I'm not allowing it either. I couldn't even date at 15. And Jade's like, well, you also came from Haiti, mom. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Garcelle in a talking head relates this story where she was in a car, her car with a boy. And she was going to Debbie's house and lied about saying she was going to Debbie's house, but she was with this boy. and they their parents found out and all of a sudden the dad is like chasing the car with the boy in it garcelle stops kicks the boy out and i guess just infuriated her folks those are sometimes like those stories that you hear about that you're like damn this is when i wish we did have cameras everywhere and we could flash back to that scene like wouldn't you love to see garcelle behind the wheel of a car just flooring it trying to like run away from her dad in a camaro Anyways, they show a picture of Garcelle at 12 and she's beautiful even at 12. And Garcelle's like, 
okay, so for my movie screening, who are you inviting, Jade? And Jade's like, Ashlyn. And Garcelle's like, she's coming? Yep, okay. And your brother? Well, I'm not inviting him, Mom. Garcelle in the talking head says, I'm so excited about my movie, Black Girl Missing. To be in a place in my career now that I get to executive produce a movie, I have say so. And we see a conversation from a month earlier, and we saw a little bit about the making of this film last season, I believe. Karen Wilson, the director of programming for Lifetime Original Movies, says, that was so brilliant of you to like really step in and make sure that we got this gentleman as a director. Um, this guy, the director Delmar Washington, who directed Black Girl Missing, is sitting next to her. So we see that Garcelle was a part of this process from the very beginning, helped get this movie made for Lifetime. Okay, so now we cut over to the Minkoff household at the dinner table. And uh, I got to remind you, I was just over at Crystal and Rob's. I call him Crystal and Rob. I was over there a couple of weeks ago. And I will say it is funny because I was like, I was in that kitchen. I had a glass of wine right there in that kitchen where this scene takes place. Anyways, we have this song. It's like, gotta dance, gotta live, gotta wonder, gotta learn how to keep getting younger, gotta keep living life to the fullest. You know, those bullshit, like in her, in her the, the songs, stupid songs. Anyways, Juliana put the lyrics to the song. So this is Crystal's uh, storyline. Uh, Max, her 10 year old who I got to meet. And I was like, Max is a little star. He came in from like a karate lab. No, he came in from his buddy's house. And it was like, just like a normal family. It reminded me of like my family in a little bit, just in a way better house. Anyways, uh, Max lets us know that he wants to get a perm. How does a 10 year old even know what a perm is? When I was a kid, I had really tight pubic hair typed hair. It was really tight curls and people would call me pubic head. And I remember when I was 14, was it 14 or 15? We paid to get it straightened and then it straightened for like a day. And then it like got even curlier the next day. It was like, um, but I wanted straight hair so badly. I wanted it. I wanted to be able to go long, straight hair, rock star hair. And I just had like this curly pubic hair. It was just so gross. And now I like kind of that. I have, I don't even have the curly hair that I did as a kid. I just have wavy hair. Uh, but anyways, Crystal's like, you're going to look like Annie with a perm. And Rob is like, is there something wrong with that? And Max, her son is like, yeah, mom, is there something wrong with looking like Annie? And Crystal's like, I'm not just, I'm not hating on you. I'm just curious. And Max is like, you are hating on me. Now, Lucy, Crystal's house manager, who we've met many times, she's there and says goodbye. She's like, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Max. And Crystal's like, hey, Max, take your sister up and watch a movie. They're going to watch Back to the Future. That's a classic. God what I would give and what would you guys at this point, if you could, I always think about this. If you could go back, what age would you go back to like that age where like 10, 11, 12, where there wasn't a care in the world where you were able to like, Hey, just like enjoy a movie without thinking about, can I pay the bills? Who do I have to take care of? Who did I upset today? Like what's that perfect age that you would go back to? Is there a perfect age? Anywho, those are the deep thoughts that I have during real housewives of Beverly Hills. <laughs> so Crystal asks Rob how China was because Rob just got back from China and Rob's like, it was awesome. It was great. It was an ordeal getting there. And Crystal's like, Jeff, Crystal's brother texted me. He was going to see Vivi and Vivi is Jeff's ex that he almost got married to. And Rob goes, yeah, he's seen her in Shanghai today for lunch. Crystal and talking in the talking head says Jeff and Rob are super close. We see some pictures of them. They love to travel together. And recently Jeff went, Jeff went to China and Rob and I have a home there. So Rob had to get back, check on the house. But this trip is particularly hard on Jeff because it's the first time seeing his ex-fiancee. Crystal, hey, if you're listening, can I be the China house watcher? Like I could just record out of the China house and I could just make sure everything's copacetic in the China house. I don't even think that's what I'm just going to call it now. The China house. Hey, can I stay in your China house? We get a flashback to three weeks earlier at Madre's restaurant where Jeff is telling Crystal, well, she called me in Mexico, Vivi. And Crystal's like, okay. And Jeff's like, well, it brought up everything because it's been two years. I've been single for two years. And back in this scene, Crystal tells Rob, well, how was he feeling there in China? And Rob says, I mean, the truth is he has not moved on. That's really the truth. And Crystal will whisper, she's like, I know. Crystal in a talking head says, three years ago, Jeff was engaged to his fiance. They were living in China. When the pandemic hit, my mom and I were desperate to get Jeff, Jeff back in the States and essentially forced him to come home. However, Vivi couldn't come to the States and all that distance. And that is why they ended up breaking up. Ooh, damn. 
like Crystal, <laughs> Crystal potentially broke up. Crystal and Crystal's mom potentially broke up Jeff's relationship. Oh man, I. By the way, we better say Vivi this season. Vivi better be in a scene this season. I need to talk to Vivi. I need to know what her experience was. I mean, this is like a pandemic love story that just gets broken up. Rob says, well, Jeff, he thinks he has gotten over it, but he hasn't. And he's kind of at war with himself. And Crystal's like, that's why he won't share it with me. He's been mad. And Rob's like, yeah, he's been conflicted. He's been ambivalent. Ambivalent. He should have said no. The fact that he didn't say no is because he was more worried about what you guys thought than what he thought. And by the way, if you're more worried about what other people thought than the person you're in a relationship with, it's probably good that you're actually not in the relationship with that person anymore. So Rob says, I get it for, for him to be his own man and be married and start his own family. He has to break away. He has to. And Rob laughs. Well, maybe this is about you, Crystal. Maybe it's not about Jeff and Crystal, her jaw drops. She's like, Zoiks. And Rob continues. I think that you're possibly competitive with Vivi over who gets the more primary relationship. And then I wonder where the mom fits into that too, because the mom usually wants to be the primary relationship in that. I mean, we're seeing that a little bit with Garcelle. Anyways, Crystal's like, oh God. And she scowls at Rob. And Crystal's like, whoever asked for your fucking opinion? It's like, I'm saying that way more intense. I'm not saying that like, whoever asked for your fucking opinion, Rob Minkoff, creator of the Lion King. Rob chuckles and he's like, I'm just saying. Crystal on Talking Head says, I'm leaving Rob. No, she says, Rob doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. I am not competitive with Vivi, but I do know what's best for my brother. Some people call it overbearing, but I just know what's best. Crystal goes, I'm going to FaceTime him right now. And so she FaceTimes Jeff and his eyes look puffy. And Crystal goes, um, it looks like you, you've you been crying. How you how you doing? And Rob's like, well, Chris, I think this is a good time to tell you how... Um, Oh, sorry. Rob says, Chris, I think this is a good time to tell your brother how you feel. And Crystal's like, no. And Rob's like, yes, Crystal has been feeling some reg regret. And Crystal's like, no, you just know how I feel. I feel bad. And Jeff's like holding back tears. And he's like, thank you. And Crystal's like, just like whatever happens, I support you. I love you. And Jeff goes, I just need to talk to her. I don't want to cry on the phone. And Crystal's like, I know you don't want to cry. More importantly, he doesn't want to cry on Bravo. Because once he cries on Bravo, it's game over. He's got like 10 seasons. He's like, we'll put him on an ultimate girls trip. Rob interjects and is like, hey, okay, talk later. Good, good talk. Anyways, they get off the phone and Rob's like, well, you know, one step at a time. Also, isn't Jeff like the Justin Bieber of China? Do you ever wonder, like, I wonder if I need to look into Jeff's pop star career because if he's like the Justin Bieber of China, do you think he has like insane fans that are like, and do you think they were happy that Crystal potentially ruined that relationship? Or do you think they're upset at Crystal for making Jeff potentially cry? Do you know what I'm saying? Like fans have that parasocial relationship. I'm thinking about Swifties, the, you know, the believers, all of those really ownership of their pop stars. And I wonder if Jeff has that same insane fandom. If I talk to Crystal again, I do need to ask about this. Okay. A new day brings us with Sutton and Jennifer Tilly, the actor driving to meet Sutton's horse, Santos. We got a scene with Santos, the beautiful horsey. There's a basket of fresh carrots in the back seat, just for Jennifer Tilly, not the horse. She loves carrots. Um, Juliana Carosa, who's taking the note, says, my father's Italian given name was Santos. Santos Thomas Carosa. So Santos Thomas Carosa, this recap is for you. Anyways, Jennifer Tilly's voice is so unique. I can never do it. So I'm just going to mangle it and it's not going to sound anything like her. But she's like, oh, this is really exciting. Now I'm doing Gina from, oh, this is really exciting. First trip to the paddock. You haven't met your horse yet. You haven't met him. You just saw, like, her voice. <laughs> her voice has these, like, highs, but it also has these lows. And I don't know how to do it, but it's like, you haven't met you. <laughs> Oh my God. I'm like the Ed Wood of recaps. You haven't, you haven't met your horse yet. You haven't met him. You just saw him on the internet. And son's like, well, I haven't met Santos yet. Like extreme Amazon shopping. Well, I have to start North. Is that, is that North? And Jennifer's like, yeah, North is this way. And she points and Jennifer's like, I love horses so much. And son's like, I do too. I'm so excited. Imagine being excited about owning a horse. It's like, it's like us being excited about going to the movies. Jennifer's like, well, this one looks so beautiful. Does it have a name already? And son's like, yeah, 
His name is Santos. <laughs> His name is Santos. He's a horse with beautiful eyes. I bought him on Amazon Prime on a great Cyber Monday deal. I got an email for rich people that said, do you want to buy a horse? And that's when Santos came into my life. <laughs> And I now know what love is for. Santos keeps me alone. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God, you guys. Okay. <sighs> Sudden in the talking head goes, One day I was with my manicure, pedicure lady. <laughs> I've got a lady for that. I was with my manicure, pedicure lady, I see, I see. And I love her so much. And she's got a horse. So I thought, well, I want a horse too. <laughs> Sutton goes at this. How do you not love this? Sutton has a manicure pedicure lady that has a horse. So she was like, I love the way she does my nails. I should buy a horse. So I, it's not like it's like Girl Scout cookies. Like they're going door to door of like, we're selling horses. That, well, I want to help out the Girl Scouts of America. I guess I'll buy a horse. She just likes her manicure pedicure lady so much. And she talked about a horse. She's like, well, I got a good feeling from you, manicure pedicure lady. I want to buy a horse too. So she's like, so I looked on. <laughs> so I looked on. <laughs> so I looked on. <laughs> so I looked online. <laughs> And I saw Santos. <laughs> I saw Santos. It's like the online dating thing. No, it isn't. It is not like the online. I looked, it was like the online dating thing. And it had prompts. And Sutton was like holding a big fish, like on hinge with the guys holding a big fish. And I knew that was mine. And then it turns out Santos was married, but he was just on the apps trying to get some on the down low. Anyways, she goes, I said, Santos, that horse is the perfect match for me. And I will tell you, when me and Ronnie Karam had a conversation with Sutton, this episode had not aired yet. And she Sutton did say, I did say Sutton because I did see him online. Oh, I love Sutton so much. And I know she I know she wouldn't appreciate why I love her. It's this love relationship. I love her so much and she wouldn't ever understand why I love her. <laughs> Sorry, you guys, I, I gotta be professional. I say he's the perfect match for me. And I hit bye. I hit bye. B U I hit bye. So therefore, I now have Santos. Can you imagine being so great? Also, what is this fucking horse dating website that there's just a big buy button? Shouldn't there be more paperwork than this? I hit buy, and now I own a stable of 30 horses. <laughs> it makes no sense. There's a big buy button, and then there's also a sell button for horses. <laughs> I need to see this horse dating app immediately. We see a picture of Santos. It's George Santos from the government. Um... No, we see a picture of Santos, a dark brown, almost black and white painted coat with several braided plates in his mane hanging. It was beautiful with those plates and mane hanging down. I say, I say, it says Frisian warm blood cross, $47,000. Now, listen, I just watched on Miami. Alexia's husband gave her like a $77,000 watch, $47,000. That's a steal for a live living horse that you buy online. I don't have anywhere near $47,000, but I love that. I was like, that's reasonable. That's a good price for that's I was looking around at nobody. And well, that's a good price for a horse. You got, you can't pass $47,000. That's unhurt. Yeah. That's a steal. Are there like, are there like, like where, when I bought my Toyota Corolla, where I, can you lease horses? Can you like rent to own? Like, is there like a three year protection plan? How does this horse buying process work? And then does Sutton's like money manager get involved? Like, how do we know that Sutton's not being taken by like some kind of horse? Like, you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? Like, what if she's getting like ripped off? Do we know this is a good price for Santos? Has Santos been checked out as like when like uh, when you buy a home or I've seen on TV, I'll never know what that's like. But when you buy a home, you have to have somebody come in and see if it's like, a good a good house is that like for horses like where they check out the undercarriage or like this is good braiding this is going to last you a while anyway Sutton's like well some people change their names 
but I liked his name, Santos. And Jennifer's like, Santos, see, I love that name. And son's like, yeah, it's a good name, Santos. They arrive at the Paddock Riding Club, a private facility for horse boarding and training comprised of 20 acres of land. And it's one of the last remaining equestrian centers, communities in Los Angeles. It's not a center, it's a community, folks. It's a community. I will tell you, I got married um, at the Burbank Equestrian Center. What was it? Uh, Calamigos Equestrian Center in Burbank. There's also a Calamigos Equestrian Center, I believe, in Malibu, but we couldn't afford that one. We got married at the one in Burbank, and it, it really was beautiful. Um, but this is at the Paddock Riding Club. And uh, Juliana is amazing. She says a 12 by 12, 12 box stall is $895 a month. I mean, for Los Angeles, that's a great price. And I'm sure this is a good area. Like, I wonder if you could just like, could I just get a place there? Could I like, could I have like a little office at the the equestrian center? And I could just record out of this like 12 by 12 unit. 895, that's a steal for land in Los Angeles. I might look into that. Um, Sun's like, well, we're here. And Jennifer's like, oh, fantastic. And Sun's like, well, good thing we got four wheel drive because the car is bouncing through some ruts. And Sun's like, ooh, I wore my pants. I wore my magic Mike pants to meet Santos. Sun in a talking head goes, my father was from Texas. So I would go every summer. I say, I say, since I was eight years old on a horse, lassoing chicken. <laughs> lasso and chick are you supposed to lasso chickens lasso. i don't know anything about farm life so this could be every i have a huge farming contingent that listens that are probably like you bastard you made fun of lassoing chickens and that's what we do on these farms sounds like i also used to snap string beans. i can't get through this recap i also used to snap string beans with my mother you know that's who i am <laughs> I'm so I'm Southern. She goes, I'm Southern. <laughs> I'm Southern. I used to snap string beans. <laughs> I was eight years old on a horse, lassoing chickens, snapping string beans, string beans, collecting straw and making big old hats. Snapping string beans, shucking corn. <laughs> I was eight years old, shucking corns, lassoing chickens. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure this is like what you actually do, but what if it turns out you're not supposed to lasso chickens? And an eight year old mini son's like, you know, come here, let me lasso you chickens. I'll say, I'll say, come on, let me lasso you. I'm gonna snap string beans next and shuck corn. Ooh, eight year old something. Woo, I'm southern. Anyways, they're going. Sun's like, let's go meet, let's go meet Santos. And Sun retrieves a green leaf. Sun, Sun has a nice like wine and cheese basket for Santos. Sun retrieves, Sun retrieves a green leaf and red rose garland from her Ford FX four x four truck bed. And Jennifer's like, are you gonna put that on your horse? And Sun's like, yeah, I'm Southern. This is what we do. We put green leaf and red rose garland all over our horses. They're greeted by the staff. And uh, this lady's like, hello, I'm Lauren. Nice to meet you. Welcome to the Paddock Riding Club. And son's like, I was told by my manicure lady to get a horse. I got one online and here we are. No, she's like, I'm really kind of nervous. Kind of like meeting a date. And Lauren's like, no, it, it's not actually. This is a horse. Jennifer's like, well, it's kind of a blind date. I hope you like him. I hope he doesn't bite you. Could you imagine? <laughs> They're left to San Santos's stall. <laughs> Come on, next next year at Gay Pride in West Hollywood, I need Sutton on Santos riding the streets of Santa Monica Boulevard. Here is uh, from the show Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and the owner of Sutton Concept, Sutton Strack, riding on Santos. Hello, everybody. It's me, Santos. <laughs> it's me, Sutton, with my horse, Santos. Shuck some corn for us. We're Southern. Anyways, they're led to Santos's stall. And Sutton's like, well, this is Nicole. She's my trainer. So already, Nicole, we now have a new character, a trainer, that Sutton, like Sutton has a staff for Santos. Nicole's like, so nice to meet you. This is Santos. And Sutton's eyes light up. It's, it's magical. And Sutton, you know, it's like... 
it's like love at first sight. And so, you know, um, and sons like wise men say, many fools rush in, cause I can't help falling in love with Santos. Anyway, Sutton's eyes light up when she sees Santos. She's like, ha, don't bite me. It'd be great if Sutton was like, name him, Santos. Name him. Name him. And Jennifer from the, the paddock uh, place goes, hi, Santos. You have to give him the carrots so he'll like you. And so it's like, I bought him. He better like me. I paid $44,000 American. Are you kidding me? Santos is a very beautiful horse. Friendly, curious, interactive, erotic, all of those things. And Sutton's like, well, you want to eat those roses? I know. Because she's hanging the rose garland on Santos and feeding Santos fresh carrots. I feel like by the end of the season, Santos is going to be eating caviar, Crystal, the whole deal. You'll see Sutton like Sunday brunches at like Tom Tom. It's going to be a whole scene. And Jennifer's like, oh, yummy and healthy too. Yeah, you like the carrots, don't you? And Sutton's petting him and feeding him and smiling. And suddenly a waterfall of drool and spit spills out of San Santos's mouth and the ladies jump back. And, you know, because by the way, Santos, I mean, there's a lot for Santos. And, but also I'm sure this is a sign of love. You know, when I drool uh, all over, it means I do love you as well. And Jennifer's like, oh, there's all kinds of stuff coming out of his mouth. Sutton and a talking head's like, this is the best first date I've been on in years, except I don't get to ride him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm Southern. <laughs> she laughs at her own jokes. That would be wild if Sutton was like, oh, gross. I'm selling Santos. You're disgusting. Oh, gross. You spitting up all over me, Santos? We got to train you. You don't spit up over me. You spit up over Erica Jane. Oh, Santos, can I tell you about the Magic Mike show? They didn't bring me on stage, and I had my, I had my dick riding pants on, and, and I just don't know. It was so offensive to me, Santos. I hope you'll never like that for me. Anyway, Sutton's petting Santos, and she's like, I hope her mares makes a Western saddle. I say, I say, well, speaking of eating, do you want to have some? I'm starving. And Jennifer Tilly's like, I'd love to. And Nicole's like, as a reward, now you can go get some lunch. A reward for what? Meeting your horse? They set up at a lovely table. It's... <laughs> I love where Sutton sets up meals like they set up a meal for her and Jennifer Tilly last time in her store midday while the store was open. And now they've set up um, inside the members area at this place. Sutton's opens up her picnics basket and she's loaded with lunch and a bottle of wine. And Jennifer Tilly's like, I'm so happy we're going to eat. And they toast. She's like, congratulations to you and Santos, your new baby. Ride him in good health. Well, thank you, Jennifer Tilly. And then Jennifer's like, I love you. And Sutton's like, I love you too. And Jennifer's like, you travel so much. And when I get to see you, I feel like, oh yeah, I get happy Sutton time. And Sutton's like, see, if only ever, everybody else felt that same way about me. And Jennifer's like, mm. And Sutton's like, I love Kyle. We're really good friends. And Jennifer's like, yeah, she's been very kind to you. And Sutton's like, well, she has. And she also got very incensed with me, Jennifer Tilly. And they flash back to Vegas a week earlier with Kyle yelling at Sutton as they walk out of the Magic Mike show to the Sprinter. And Kyle's like, now don't you be a bitch to me. And Sutton's like, Jennifer Tilly. And then it escalated. And then they show again Sutton's kitchen one day earlier where Kyle's like, and then I saw my friend in distress and I go over there and you say, you insert yourself? By the way, fuck you. That's fucking rude. Kyle is... You know how some people can be an angry drunk? Kyle's an angry or sober person. Um, and Sutton's like, well, she said to me, she said, son, is there something going on with you? And Jennifer's like, mm-hmm. And Sutton's like, and I said, no, is there something going on with you? And Jennifer's like, mm-hmm. And Sutton's like, and I don't think it's just me, I say. I say, she's gotten very thin. We were in Las Vegas. We were on vacation. Jennifer's like, mm-hmm. Jennifer Tilly only says, mm-hmm, and Sutton's like, and she's going to the gym for like three hours, Miss Jennifer Tilly, I say, I say. They flash back to the resorts world and see Kyle. Kyle keeps reminding me, I, I, can't, I can't shake this, is like Linda Hamilton from Terminator 2. And like when she's all buff because she's training to kill the Terminator, you know, and uh, I, by the way, Rob Minkoff, I told that too, and Rob actually got a chuckle out of it. So that was... Um, uh, you know, uh, it was a delightful moment to make Rob Minkoff laugh, but she's like training, like she's going to kill the Terminator, this Kyle Richards. Um, <laughs> and son's like, her eating's a bit different. 
Jennifer goes, mm. And son's like, well, she not drinking. And Jennifer's like, uh huh. And son's like, but. And also, like, well, I haven't seen her wedding band. I don't know. I don't know what it is, Miss Jennifer Tilly. And Sutton and the talking head goes, Kyle's acting in a way I've never seen. All suspicious like. I, I mean, this is a horrible conversation. Just putting all of these things out. But, right? Like, these things are all happening, right? These things are happening. We do have to pay attention. Here are the clues. I do wish they had inter. I wish Sutton had relayed that. Well, and then, and then Jennifer Tilly, I said, name him. And Jen's like, mm. But then I said, name him again. Mm hmm. And I said, name him. Mm hmm. And then I said, name him. I want the whole conversation repeated to Miss Jennifer Tilly. Um, I told you guys this, but I want to remind you when we did have that conversation with Sutton, Sutton did say that Jennifer Tilly was close to being on the show years ago. And then she watched it and was like, yeah, there's way too many fighting. I don't, so they, they lost out on Jennifer Tilly. I still think Jennifer Tilly will eventually be an official friend of, but I thought that was an interesting little tidbit. And it's right. Like Jennifer Tilly, an amazing actor. If you haven't seen her in bullets over Broadway, my God, what a performance, but also she is like a world star poker player. Like she has had an amazing career. I believe she was married or in a relationship with, um, What's his name? The cre one of the creators of The Simpsons, who unfortunately passed away. I mean, she's had a really fascinating life. I mean, she would be a really fun person to interview. And now she's on the Chucky TV show. Maybe we, Sandra, if you're listening, we should maybe reach out to Jennifer Tilly and see if she'd ever come on because that would be such an interesting interview if she'd be willing to do it. Um, Sudden in a talking head goes, Kyle's acting in a way I've never seen. I notice it. Santos notices it. Miss Jennifer Tilly notices it. They flash a headline from All About the Tea. Clues, Kyle Richards and Mauricio Omansky's marriage is in trouble. Now, remember, Sutton reads everything. We know that from the Erica Jane, Tom Girardi stuff. She's the only one that read the LA Times article, but she reads everything. Now, Sutton continues in a talking head. Well, now we have a rumor in the tablo tabloids, the tablizzes about Mo cheating. So I just feel like when there's all this, and she pauses, numbers. And then the producers do this little like producer thing and they put a Sutton equation on the screen, like an equation, a math equation on the screen. And it like in parentheses, it says acting strangely plus working out excessively plus tabloid rumors. And then underneath that, losing weight times never been home. And then a bar equals two. And then it says not drinking plus no wedding ring. Now, I know there's probably official math terms for some of those things, but I am not in school anymore and I don't need to know math. <laughs> Hello, IRS. Anyways, th I love that this is Sutton's version of that movie, A Beautiful Mind with Russell Crowe. It's like losing weight time, never been home. If you subtract that and then you add Santos, you got to add Lisa Rinna and then you divide that long division and then not wearing the wedding ring. And then you got Morgan Wade and then you got the leather pants and Magic Mike. That comes up with Sutton and the talking there goes, it adds up to something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong, I say, in the city of Beverly Hills. Something's wrong, I say. <laughs> it's like the music man all of a sudden. I was with Santos and Jennifer Tilly. And I just kept thinking, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something smells weird in Beverly Hills. What's going on with Mo? What's going on with her drinking? And no wind, the wedding ring, and dropping massive amounts of weight. Something's wrong. Something's wrong, I say. And Jennifer's like, well, she might be going through something. It sounds like she's going through a lot of times when these people get on these extreme self-improvement plans or, you know, like when somebody cuts their hair all of a sudden or, or whatever, it's because they're trying to move on to a new phase of their life. And a lot of times it's because I'm not going to say running away from something, but because they're desperately trying to regain control of their life. And I love, this is what you call in acting, active listening. Sutton is a great active listener because she's got those big eyes and she's like, I'm listening intently to everything Miss Jennifer Tilly tells me about her thoughts on Kyle. And I do think Jennifer Tilly is, Miss Jennifer Tilly is completely right in this, is she's right. A lot of times people, when they are on like extreme self-improvement plans, they're trying to move to that new phase in their life. That is what Kyle's doing. And the more you get into this, the more you think you have this mental clarity. And maybe you do, maybe you do, but you're always kind of running away from something as well, but you are trying to regain control. So the more you work out, the more you do all of these things and commit to this new lifestyle, it's the control that you didn't have in your previous life. Okay. 
So now we're at another day with Erica and the person that she calls her mom. So we had a shot of the pool house and Erica's like, mom, mom. And Ray's like, yeah, I'm making us some tea. No one washed the cup. Didn't you wash the fucking things? There's only one teacup there. Like, what? I told Mike to wash these fucking cups. I'm Erica Jane. You're a filthy pig, Renee. Renee's like, was I supposed to? Yeah, you're supposed to wash the dishes. <laughs> You left a floater in the toilet, Renee. There's a big old dookie. I swear to God, Renee. How dare you? I can't believe you had me. Anyways, Renee goes, well, I, I thought Belle, Belle would be coming. Mom, Belle comes once a week. That's all I can afford. This is no five days a week shit no more. So she's saying that she used to have like a daily housekeeper. And now Belle comes once a week. You know, some people, they don't even have a once a weeker. They have to do it all themselves. So Erica learning how to clean out her old, her own cups. I mean, it's so motivational for so many reasons. I know, but wouldn't you, I really want to see the rest of this house and the cleanliness of it. Like what if there's floaters in the toilet? What if it's just like, oh my God, there's pubic hair all over this toilet seat. I guess I don't even know why I keep bringing pubic hair. To, I'm so sorry. This is so, so bad. Um, but I bet it's, you know, it's like those people's house you go over and it's like their bathtub just got this big brown stain that never like is able to go away. And I bet she, every, everything I bet she blames on Renee, like, Renee, how dare you? This bathtub has mold. I, I swear to God, I wasn't here before you got here, Renee. Eric and a talking head deeply rolling her eyes and blowing raspberries. She's like, my mom and I only go for about 24 hours and then we start picking at each other. Really? Because it only seems like you're picking at her. Renee's like, well, I did put some stuff in the dishwasher. And Erica's like, the dishwasher is here. Yeah, I know. Well, you poured it over there. And Renee's like, well, whatever. I'm not here every day. So, you know, the producers put on the screen visit duration 31 hours thus far. Erica and a talking head's like, well, now she will tell you that I do not get on her nerves, but I know I do. And I am woman enough to tell you she gets on my nerves. Is that like a big staple of a woman? Like, you're a real woman if you hate your mom. <laughs> you're a real woman if you admit you hate your mom. <laughs> Renee goes, well, I know when I talk to you about Broadway, Miss Erica Jane. <laughs> I know when I talk to you about Broadway and about you telling me how much the city had changed. And they showed a photo of the Beverly Hills ladies who went to New York to see Erica's show when she did Chicago in 2020, right before the pandemic. We see Kyle. Um, who's the Kyle's friend? The one, what's her name? Oh, Freddie. Freddie Mellencamp. Erica Dorit, but blonde Dorit. Sutton. Uh, uh, Santos, Santos, no, and, and a fake ponytailed Rinna. And Erica's like, sad, it's sad. And Renee's like, well, I'm glad I got to see your show. And Erica's like, well, me too. Even though you didn't tell me you were coming and we were not in the best place personally and it was somewhat of an ambush. Kind of like how you ambush Sutton in the elevators in Vegas because of Magic Mike. Is it that kind of ambush? But also imagine being at a point with your mom where you don't want her at your Broadway show and that you see her and you're like, how dare you come? Eric and the talking head's like, I just remember the door coming open and I was like, ah, oh my God, there she is. And she was socializing with everybody. Oh my God. Hey, hi. I was like, ah. Erica, let other people enjoy your success. Anyways, Renee's like, I didn't mean to ambush you, Erica. You know, you wouldn't let me know where, when, when I could go. And Erica's like, Mom, excuse me. I was not talking to you for a year before that because you hung up on me. And Aunt Renee's like, no, you hung up on me. Well, that's right. I did hung up on you because you were making the conversation about yourself. And I was trying to talk to you. Which is it, Erica? It starts off with she hung up on me. And then Renee's like, no, you hung up on me. And it's like, goddamn right I did. <laughs> Renee's like, no, I was not, Erica. The reason that you hung up on me is because I asked you a question that has to do with Tom. And you didn't like me asking that question. And you hung up on me. And Erica shoots her mom a dagger look. And Erica and her talking head goes, Things were so bad. I know that she didn't know that. But things were so bad at the time. But Miss little Miss Erica Jane, I was literally trying to get through those shows. I'm a showman. I'm, I'm doing a good job there. And then back in Los Angeles... Tom Gerardi is M-I-A. Really? And Renee's like, how many times did you ever go over to that firm? Three and 20 years? 
You're talking about Tom Girardi's law firm. Like she only visited three times. And Erica's like, stop. You've got to stop that lot of conversation. Okay. I do want to point out something interesting right here. Remember back in the day when the story broke about uh, Tom and Erica and Erica's story was, I drove Tom Girardi to work like I do all the time. And then I came back and I packed up the house and I left and I never saw him again. So she let us know that she dropped Tom off at work. And that was, uh, they lived in Pasadena. The law firm was in what, like central Los Angeles. I have been there and that's quite a drive. And we're supposed to believe that Erica didn't. So was this one of the three times or was this a bullshit story? Like I thought at first, I did not think in any world imaginable that Erica Jane was dropping Tom Girardi off at work. No, they had chauffeurs. It was bullshit. Anyways, Renee goes, uh, Erica's like, stop. You got to stop that line of conversation, mom. And Renee's like, pardon me. And Erica's and talking to her, goes, shit is blowing up. I'm trying to keep it all together. Smile and sing and dance. And there's Renee, you know, just like ready to fuck it up all for me. Is she ready to fuck it up all for What are you talking about? What are you? I, the, the show did not present it well enough to make me believe that Renee is a monster. You know, like it did not present it. And now I liked Renee so much in this episode in the tiny amount that I saw her. I want her to move in full time with Erica Jane. Like, I want this to be bosom buddies. I want this to be the odd couple. I want, you know, Renee's like, where were you last night, Miss Erica Jane? I was out there getting dick, dick town. How dare you? You've got to be, there's going to be a curfew when you're staying here with Renee, your mama. No, I'm a grown woman. I'm going out and get dick. No. <laughs> I will put you over my knee. Erica goes, even talking about it now, I put, I've so put myself ahead of it. Even having to go back and talk about these things again, it's just like cutting open an old healing wound. But thankfully, I don't have any real blood or heart within me. So it's just blank. You got me all you want. <laughs> Renee's like, well, at some point, you've got to let it go. Well, you have to let her heal and move on, as my therapist says. She's teaching, hey, mom, have you heard about this thing called empathy? Are you talking about empathy? No, it's called empathy. Oh, empathy? Oh, okay, I've been saying it wrong. Anyways, Erica's like, you know why? I can't do anything about it, but I'm super happy. All that is behind me now. And she winks at the camera, and there's a big pause. And Renee's like, so, I brought paints. I think she says paints. But I was like, oh, maybe she like pants, like Sutton's dick riding pants from Magic Mike. But Erica pulls her hair and rolls her eyes like, oh, my. Oh, my God. Paints. Fuck you, Renee. Like, I don't see what the big deal was. The lady did not come. Am I, am I, am I going crazy? The lady did not come off that bad. Her mom, Renee. Like, I need more Renee scenes to suss out why she's so bad. And I get it. We all have a weird relationship with our parents to a degree. But come on, man. Erica and a talking head goes, I love seeing my mom. I'm grateful that she supports me. And I'm grateful that she's leaving because I'm dropping her ass off in the valley. I've reached my limit and I'll see you at Christmas, Renee. Heartwarming. Heartwarming. They show, or they show Erica alone now at the kitchen table, holding her head in her hands. And she's like, thank God this is almost over. Okay. Okay. So now it's Garcelle's big day. We're getting the glam for Black Girl Missing screening party. And this is one of those classic, like, housewife tropes where they now do, like, the FaceTime round robins. And I do wonder, as a producer, like, how you shoot these. Like, so you send one camera crew to Kyle's and one camera crew to Sutton's, and then you get the other person on the FaceTime. So we see everybody's getting ready. So we see Garcelle getting ready. We're over at Kyle's house, and she's on a FaceTime with Dorit. And Kyle's like, hi, honey, how are you? And Dorit's like, you're doing your makeup yourself? And Kyle's like, yeah. I mean, tonight's just a screening, right? Red carpet, step and repeat. And Kyle's like, that's fine. Huh, Houston, we got a problem. And Dorit's like, what do you mean? And Kyle's like, I had the most strange visit with Sutton. <laughs> um, I do, I, I like the thought of Kyle not doing as much glam because she's living authentically now. He's like, I don't need makeup anymore. I'm living authentically. We cut over to Sutton's house where she's calling Garcelle on FaceTime. And Sutton's like, I'm so excited for you, Garcelle. It's going to be so fun. Are your boys coming? Are you good? 
And so, no, so Garcelle's like, are you good? And Sutton's like, uh-huh. Well, Kyle came over a couple of days ago to my house. How did that go? Well, it didn't end well, I say, I say. I know, I, I don't know. I, I had a conversation about the elevator. Now we cut back to Kyle's house. So this is like the, tell me more, tell me more. Da, she, da, da, da. It's like the Grease, Sandy, Danny thing. And Kyle is very agitated talking to Dorit. She's like, she thinks that Erica set up the elevator doors opening and having Mikey. And Dorit's like, oh my God, she thinks that? She does. She 100% believes that. I believe it too, by the way. I'm sorry. I believe that 100%. Kyle stands up and begins to mock what Sutton did. And Kyle's all snark. He's like, this is what she did. And she starts flinging her arms around 10 times more than dramatic than Sutton even did. And Kyle's whipping her hair back and forth. And she's like, well, Sutton, I say, I say, there's your chance to apologize. Kyle loves a good imitation of another housewife. And I really like it. They flash back two days earlier to Sutton doing that scene in her kitchen where Sutton's dramatically waving her arms like, Oh, Sutton, now's your chance. You can apologize. Ah. I love, I love when they make, I love when they imitate each other. I love it. Kyle's like, I was like, ah, and she drops her mouth open. And Kyle's like, and I said, what's going on with you? And she said, what's going on with me? What's going on with you? And Kyle acts ghoulishly like she's staring, like in one of those Halloween movies that she likes to do. And Dorit's like, that feels like a threat, Kyle. My putster is acting up. My PTSD. That feels threatening. It doesn't feel threatening, Dorit. Calm down. It's not threatening. Everybody needs to grow up and put their big girl pants on, myself included. Let's put our big girl spanks on and chill out. That was not threatening. And Kyle's like, oh, it was. It was, Dorit. And I knew automatically she's talking about the rumors out there. The Venus of the Virgin? I Wouldn't you kill if Meredith Marks pops up? It's like, I need to talk about the Venus about you and Mauricio. You want to talk about the husband? We talk about the husband. You can leave. Did you know sometimes I always in a jacuzzi with her? I can't believe that. And Kyle's like, oh, yeah, it was it was very threatening. We cut back to Sutton's and Garcelle's like, well, was it volatile or was it like, girl, whatever? And Sutton pauses and thinks, well, I'm not. Hmm. It was quick. I mean, she was at my house maybe 20 minutes. No. Yeah, Garcelle, she was. Back at Kyle's. And Reed's like, was she in a bad mood? No, it wasn't just a bad mood. Well, you know, I'm riding with Sutton tonight. Where she's picking me up on Santos. And Kyle's like, you're kidding. Wait, you're riding with her tonight? I'm riding with her, yes. Well, have fun with that. And she sneers sarcastically at Dorit. Kyle, just very nasty, Kyle. Calm down. Back at Sutton's, their car, you know, with Dorit in it, pulls up to pick up Sutton. And Sutton's getting dressed and ready. And she's heading down the stairs to leave. And Avi, her assistant, her house and property manager, begins to direct a photo shoot. She's like, yes, give it, Sutton. Let's give that look. And Avi's like, just take a picture quickly. Come on. And Dimitri, <laughs> we have another staff member of Sutton's, Dimitri, who takes the photos. Dimitri's like, there you go. Come on. Beautiful. You look amazing. Let's get the shot. And Sutton's like, well. And Dimitri to Sutton's like, over the shoulder. Let's get it over the shoulder shot. Sutton walks away and turns over to look at her shoulder while Dimitri snaps away. And Avi's like, should I put some lights on? Sutton and that talking head goes, I'm learning that social media is the venue for sales and exposure. And my store needs that constantly. <laughs> I like Sutton's getting into the influencer lifestyle. I love it. Dimitri's like, beautiful. Walk towards me, Sutton. Let's get that sexy look. Yeah. Okay. Act like I'm Santos. Look at me. Yeah, that's it. Sutton continues in a talking head. So I'm bringing Dimitri in to take some good pictures of me. They flash back to Sutton at the paddock meeting with Santos. And Dimitri was there doing a photo shoot with Sutton and Santos. Oh, my God. That's what I need is my holiday card. I need me, Sutton, and Santos in holiday card. Um, but now we have so many people on Sutton's payroll. My God. The camera pans out to the car with Dorit waiting, looking at herself with a hand mirror while she talks on the phone. They don't say who she's talking to. Can you believe she's not even ready? I'm like parked outside waiting this whole time. Beep, boop, beep, boop, boop, boop. How many times have we waited for Dorit so she can take pictures of herself looking out of a window dramatically? Are you kidding me? 
Be self-aware, police. Back in the house, Dimitri is posing Sutton. Let me quickly do it in front of the bookcase. Oh, yeah, sexy. Let's do it in front of the Fifty Shades of Grey's books. Yeah, yeah, Harry Potter, yeah. So it's like, oh, my God. Dimitri's like, love it, beautiful. Yes, we've got the shot. Um, out in the car, Dorit's like, I like, literally, I could have done with this extra time. In the house, Dimitri's like, let's see the clutch. Yeah, show the clutch off, Sutton. Yeah. In the car, Dorit's back in the hand mirror, examining her face and her teeth, sucking on a breath mint. Back in the house, Avi is adjusting a curl that's going along Sutton's face. And so, like, oh my gosh, these days. And Avi's like, perfect, darling. And cut to Dorit. Oh my God, please. Finally, Sutton comes out the front door, looking very surprised that the car's already there. And what was stopping, like, if Dorit was this, like, you know, pent up, like, just, Give a little knock on the door. Come in. Do the photo shoot with Sutton. Come on. Dorit to Sutton out the window goes, you are very late. <laughs> beep, boop, ah, beep, boop, boop, boop. Sutton climbs into the car and goes, oh. Dorit instructs the driver, I think if you could put the air a little less cold. <laughs> well, you look beautiful, Sutton. Thank you. Sorry. You know, I'm really late. It's the famous Hollywood sign all of a sudden we see, and a scene cuts to Garcelle arriving to her screening. We're at Beauty, Ex Beauty and Essex, Essex, which is on Cuenga Boulevard. I've been there before. And Garcelle's like, after the movie, maybe I'll have you take them home because it's a school night, okay? Because her sons. Garcelle, her two sons, and their two fem female friends uh, enter a lavish area set up with classy leather and velvet seating, a well-stocked bar, mood lighting, shiny accent pieces filling the room. And um, Jax is like, wow, it's pretty nice, huh? The general manager of Beauty and Essex comes in. It's like, hello, I'm Kima. Nice to meet you. Welcome to your space. Um, welcome to our space. Kima's like, well, well, we'll have all of your guests here and we see the screening area. And then we'll have the step and repeat right outside. And it says Garcelle Productions. I need a t-shirt that says Garcelle Productions. I love it. Garcelle goes, amazing, amazing. Um, and then the evening begins. Guests begin to come in. A photographer is catching everyone. We see Taz, Garcelle's assistant. Garcelle greets everyone enthusiastically as they come in. Uh, Garcelle's realtor, Susan, comes in. <laughs> My realtor is here to see Black Girl Missing. And Garcelle goes, well, Kyle Richards, wow, you look so cute. I've never seen this look on you. And Kyle's just wearing beige everything. And it's a beige pants, pantsuit with a mashing beige Kimosabe hat and carrying an orange purse, or, you know. But the Kimosabe hat, that is, that's the key element to this outfit. And Kyle's like, yeah, you've seen the hat look. And Garcelle goes, very chic. We'll take this. She touches Kyle's handbag. And Kyle's like, this is a new addition. It's her first time out. And it's an Hermes Kelly 28 priced at $16,000. I mean, this is amazing. I, I just, I just, I don't, I mean, wow. I just would be so scared that somebody would just tackle me for this purse. I mean, poor Dorit has been mugged two times. Uh, Kyle and a talking head goes, as an actor and a producer myself, I can appreciate how difficult it is to get a project sold and made. Yeah. And Kyle's like, are you excited, Garcelle? I'm so excited. I'm a little nervous. First of all, I have so many people coming. You've been doing this forever. You can do it. And Garcelle goes, I know. <laughs> Kyle continues in a talking head. Not only is she producing it, she's starring in it. And it's a story with a very important message. Garcelle to her guest standing nearby. She's like, she's, uh, Kyle's an actress too. So Kyle gets it. Kyle's like, you're so great. And you've been doing it so long. So excited. Um, we're back in Dorit and Sutton's car. And Dorit's like, what time is the screening? Well, it didn't really say on the invite. Oh, it didn't? Hopefully we'll be able to have a drink, a cocktail before we go in. Well, I talked to Garcelle and there's like a hundred people coming. I say, I say, wow. Yeah. So that's like hood and cats. Yes. There's only six of us, and it's hood and cats with us. Just us Beverly Hills women. Yes. Dorit and Natalia goes, I was under the impression that Garcelle was having a very intimate screening. If I'm not prepared mentally and emotionally, it can trigger me. Dorit tells Sutton, you have no idea. I feel really uncomfortable in crowds. At least I would prepare myself. You know what I mean? I guess she's referring to the, the robberies. This is affecting her PTSD in a big crowd. So 
we do now, it's starting to really unravel that she is really, really messed up with these things. And of course you would be, but I do feel like these are questions you could ask before you get in a car or just shoot Garcella Tesco, ta a text of like how many people are going to be there. Uh, Crystal arrives, the room's filling up. We have Jerry O'Connell there. Um, we have Lauren Zarian, lifestyle and fashion expert. Erica arrives. She's in this like yellow get up. Erica, actually, I really actually like this Erica look. I don't know anything about fashion, so I'm guessing it's probably not a good look because I liked it, but I liked it. Uh, Kyle DeGarcel's son goes, hey, how are you? And Jax is like, how have you been, Kyle? Well, you guys are so tall. Oh, wow. And Ashlyn, you know, Jack, Jade's girlfriend is like, hi, I'm Ashlyn. Ooh, it's Ashlyn, you guys. Everybody's having fun, taking pictures on the snap and repeat. Crystal's hanging by the bar and it's like, Erica, hey. And Erica shuffles over. I didn't want a crown. Everyone is up here. How are you? And Crystal's like, you look great. And we see Garcelle greet her friend. Guess who it is? Larva Pippin from Real Housewives of Miami. Somebody that's dated a Pippin and a Jordan now. And uh, she tells Larza, she's like, you said I'm going to wear a slip dress. You didn't say it was a slip of a dress. Because Larza is like dressed like she's like a selling sunset realtor. There's like, I, I was like staring, I was like staring at parts of her rib cage. I was like, what? what? <laughs> Isn't this like an intense movie? <laughs> it's like, she's like, coming up the stage, we got Larza dancing next. Remember to tip Larza. She does her dance. And Lars is like, you're so hot. You look amazing, Garcelle. Outside, Dorit is gripping Sutton's arm as they walk into the venue. And Dorit's like, I get a little jumpy around a lot of people because of my putsta. And Sutton's like, okay. Sutton in a talking head goes, well, I know that Dorit is still dealing with her putsta, PTSD. I had no idea that it's this bad still. I say, I say. But okay, the putsta. Did the putsta not, like, what about the Magic Mike show? Like, oh, I didn't know I'd be around this many dongs. It, uh, it upsets my PTSD. Dongs flopping everywhere. Anyways, they go inside. Garcelle greets them with hugs. And like, she like, it's, it's Garcelle greets him with hugs. And Garcelle to Dorit's like, you look really pretty. And Dorit to Garcelle goes, stunning. Sutton continues in a talking head and goes like, we're just going, we're just going to go in and watch the movie about a girl who gets kidnapped and goes missing. Other than that, it's going to be fine. I say, I say. So that makes a good point, though. I mean, this is going to be kind of awkward for Dorit as well. I mean, it's an intense subject matter, you know, very intense. OK, so uh, Garcelle's like, I'm glad everybody can be here so we can watch the movie. And Dorit's like, yes. And the Dorit suddenly jumps and shrieks out loud and grips Garcelle's hand. And it's like, wow. Aye, aye, aye. And Garcelle looks at her and is like, are you OK? So like she kind of like is very jumpy. Crystal walks up to Garcelle's son, Jax and Jade outside. And Crystal's like, are you going to are you guys going to do the step and repeat? And Jade's like, we did earlier. And Jax is like, I'm kind of nervous because Erica's here because mom's like, Erica's here. You're going to have to talk to her. And you know what? I might as go well as go. I might as well go now. And uh, she's like, do you want to come with me, Crystal? I love that Jade, you know, he Jax is a grown man. He's like, I'm a grown man. I'm just going to go confront the situation. By the way, kind of is more of a grown man than I would be in that situation completely. And Crystal's like, who are you? You're Garcelle's son. Okay, let's go. Crystal and I talking head goes, I'm really proud that Jax wants to approach Erica since all that went down last year. We, of course, get the flashback once again to Garcelle's birthday party where Erica hammered is like, what are you doing here? And Jax is like, I'm here to get the flowers. Get the fuck out of here. Get out. And Crystal's like, don't cuss at him. Get the fuck out of here. Crystal walking Jax away is like, don't listen to these ladies. And Erica calling after him, get out of here before you get in trouble. I'll eat you. I'll make a giant. Crystal continues in a talking head. Vegas really showed me a side of Erica that is more open. The friendlier side of Erica Jane. A softer side of Erica Jane. We flash back to the Vegas plane ride over one week earlier where Erica's like, in honor of your 40th birthday, Crystal, I'm taking you to Magic Mike. Crystal finishes the talking head. I want to make an effort and really help other people see her in a better light. Okay, Crystal, help me see Erica in a better light. Jax and Crystal meander their way through the crowd to where Erica is standing. And Jax is like, all right, Crystal, you're my backup here. Someone asked Eric, Erica what she's wearing. She's like, is that Moogler? And Erica's like, this is Gaunty I, but it could be Moogla, maybe Old Navy. I'm a Maxinista now. And then Erica, it's a Larva Pippin, who is like sticking by Erica's side. And she's like, all right, let's go find a seat. And then Jax is like, hello, Erica. 
Hey, sweetheart. And Jax is like, I just wanted to come and let you know that everything is okay. Well, I apologize from the bottom of my heart. And of course, I was totally out of line. I've sent this to your mother, and I'm really happy that you get to hear it from me. So please accept my apology, because it comes from the bottom of my heart. And Jax is like, I do, of course. Thank you. I'm glad. And Jax is like, of course. I'm glad you could hear it from me. Yeah, thank you. Really, I mean, that is kind of a really cool thing. I mean, maybe the kid is all grown up. Who knows? Eric and I talking to him goes, what a class act this young man is. And just walk up and say, hey, no hard feelings. And, uh, Garcelle, you've done a beautiful job. So a very, that is a softer side of Erica Jane. That is growth. Garcelle holding a microphone is like, hey, guys, can I get everyone to move in to watch this movie? And Jax tells his mom, he's like, I went up to Eric and I said there are no hard feelings and everything is all good. And Garcelle's like, oh, I love that. And Jax is like, of course, I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And Garcelle in a talking head goes, well, I wish Erica had been the one to approach Jax because she's the adult. She's the one in the wrong. But I'm glad that Jax felt confidence enough to go talk to her himself. I do, too, as well. Now, I saw some things online of like, no. No, I don't think Erica should have been the one. I don't think that's Erica's fault. Listen, Garcelle is always going to give Erica a hard time. I mean, Erica has exhibited wild behavior. So I don't know. We'll see how this this goes. We'll see how the thawing of the Erica Jane Garcelle relationship goes. But listen, who knows? I think by the end of this season, they could be besties. Everyone's now seated to watch the movie and Garcelle's in front of the uh, front of the room giving a speech. Garcelle's like, everyone's busy. Everyone has things to do. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come out, not only to support me, but support the idea of when black and brown people go missing, that it's important that we are seen and heard and supported. And that's it. Enjoy the show. Garcelle lets us know in a talking head, black girl missing is really important to me because the subject is important. You know, so many times black and brown women are overlooked for everything. Getting a job, getting paid, going missing. All I want is the same passion and compassion for when we go missing. So really, that is a great message. That is a great reason to do this. Um, Sutton and Dorit are making their way to their seats. They're passing Erica and Larza. And Erica's like, where you guys been? And Sutton's like, in the car. And Erica's like, oh, okay. Um, Sutton, by the way, is sitting with Dorit. Uh, the movie starts and it says, Black Girl Missing. And the audience whoops and claps, star starring Garcelle Bouvet. And then we see some scenes from the movie. Listen, I will... This is not the normal kind of movie I would check out, not because I just Lifetime movies. I've never been a huge proponent or fan of, but uh, and I've been in a couple really bad ones, but I would check this out. I, I want to see because it looks like it's almost shot on a camcorder and I know they do like cheaper budgets on Lifetime movies, but I would be curious to see this movie. I would and to support Garcelle and to support this message. Anyways, all of a sudden, you guys, we see Denise fucking Richards climbing the stairs. It looks like she's wearing like some like denim outfit. Like she just got out of like Ross dress for less. Um, and, uh, we see all of these scenes. I mean, they're really intense scenes. Uh, but Denise Garcelle sees Denise and, uh, Denise whispers, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And Denise hugs Garcelle and goes, this is sad. <laughs> but Denise didn't even see the first half of the movie. So I don't wonder what this was in response to. Anyways, we see Garcelle being thrown to the floor in the movie and yelling, get off of me. She's being dragged across the, across the floor and the audience reads like, no, no. Kyle's gritting her teeth and clenching her fists and punching the air just like she's in a Halloween movie. Um we see Garcelle kicking someone's ass and fighting for her life. She runs to get away. The audience is yelling, yeah, yeah. It would be funny if Dorit kept going, yes, escape, escape, Garcelle. You can escape. I need more Dorit reaction cams. Like Raquel in the trailer and the Vanderpump reunion, I need a camera on Dorit at all times. Sutton and talking head goes, well, the world's going to take note. Do not piss Garcelle Bouvet off because you're going to get kicked in the stomach. And I'm going to get Santos to kick you as well. And then we see a scene of Garcelle running outside in the dark, dark up to her daughter laying on the ground like, oh, baby, it's OK. The movie ends with the hashtag help us find us. And it says, please visit black and missing dot com. And that's black and missing inc dot com. I went to it. It's actually a really uh, it's a website that actually kind of informs you more about this topic. I think everybody should check it out. Uh, Dorit Natagane goes, I am so excited and thrilled for Garcelle. This is a dreams coming to life. 
The audience gives her a standing ovation. Kyle finds Garcelle, gives her a hug. You are amazing. I'm so proud of you. You killed it. And Sutton's like, I cried. I started crying again. I say, I say, what's wrong with me? Thank God Santos isn't here to see, see his owner just crying like a blubbering fool. Then Crystal sees Denise and Denise is like, hi, strangers. And Dorit's like, God, what a surprise. And I, I guess Denise, the crew didn't even know Denise was going to pop into this. So I guess it really was a surprise. And then he's like, it's good to see you. And Dorit just stares at her. And Denise is like, how are your girls? Um, and Dorit's like, good. How are you? And Chris is like, you look cute. And he's wearing jeans and a hoodie jacket. And then he's like, thank you. And Dorit's like, it feels forever and ever and ever, D Denise. It feels forever. And Denise is like, so much has happened in forever. And Dorit's like, I know. Dorit in a talking head goes, I haven't seen Denise in years. We flash back to the pandemic reunion of 2020. Remember that? The Zoom reunion that was so intense where Denise gets up out of her seat and leaves the Zoom going, I'm done. And Andy's like, hold on, we're almost done. Denise, we're almost done. Kyle in her reunion Zoom throws her older man hands up and looks like a deer in headlights. <laughs> Sorry, you guys, I'm joking. I'm joking. And Kyle's like, did, did she walk off? Dorit continues in a talking head. And then our contact kind of became less and less and less. Now, Garcelle has joined them. And Denise is like, I forgot of how good of an actress Garcelle is. And Denise is like, you're really good. Sutton winds herself through a crowd over to where Kyle is seated in the corner by herself, looking down at her phone. And Sutton's like, I'm just making my way over here. I'll say, I'll say. And she sits next to Kyle. Kyle doesn't look up. And Sutton sits. Oh, Kyle still looking at her phone goes, hello, how are you? I'm good. Kyle will not look at her. Are you? And Kyle's like, are you? And Sutton's like, well, we got to talk. I'll say, I'll say, because you, you raced out of my house. Well, it wasn't easy to talk to you that night. You were so aggressive and not nice. Well, you're already doing it right now, Kyle. And Kyle's now, once again, very agitated. I'm sitting here minding my business. I mean, you came up to talk to me and I'm telling you how I feel. Do you want the truth or do you want me to lie to you? And Sutton's like, I was being very calm. Once again, a flashback to Sutton's kitchen. Name him. Well, what did you name him? Ridiculous. Name him. Uh, name him. Be quiet. Name him. Let me talk. Jesus. God, I wish that scene was just an hour episode of just Sutton saying name him and Kyle just saying different things. Name him. Name him. Name him. Anyways, in this scene, Kyle shakes her head and goes, ah, I don't think so. And Sutton squints her eyes at her. That Sutton squint eyes look. Garcelle brings Denise up to Erica, who is sitting with Crystal. And Garcelle's like, somebody wants to say hello to you. And Denise is like, hi, little missy. How are you? Denise gives her a hug. I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. Denise is like, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. How you been? Really good. Back to the first corner, Kyle flutters her hands. Uh, and Kyle's like, I mean, you just seemed off, like odd. I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was. Well, you're not going to say you were off. I will say that if I think that. Sutton in a talking head goes, Kyle was supposed to be my friend. And you're using words that you know will cut me to the core. I like that off is a word that, off, that word cuts me to the core. How dare you say off? And uh, Sutton calmly goes, well, maybe I think something's off with you. Kyle with angry eyes. Go ahead. You wanted to throw it out there the other night like such a good friend would do. Say something. Sutton continues in a talking head and take your hat off. I feel like this should have been an applause break. Everyone's like, get that goddamn Kimo Sabi hat off, please. Kyle grits her teeth. If you want to say something, say it to me, Sutton. Fuck you. <laughs> like, Jesus, God. Sutton's like, as a friend, can I not ask you as a friend? And Kyle bouncing her head hat. She's like, you, you're so full of shit. Sutton stops and looks at Kyle. Kyle bugs her eyes at Sutton. Kyle's like, you wanted to throw it out there like such a good friend, then say something. So I was like, well, there seems to be sometimes a lack of, I say, I say, and if I'm being really truthful, truthful, a lack of respect, like you treat me like a little sister. I definitely don't treat you like a little sister. Don't flatter yourself. <laughs> so this is an age thing, I think. It sounds like, excuse me, sorry. Well, these are my feelings. Well, okay. Well, I don't know if you're mad at me about the Catholic thing. Maybe you are. And Kyle makes a face. That hasn't even registered to me. Well, I'm just asking. No, it has not. I don't care about it. Kyle's just like a little brat. And Sutton in the talking head goes, she's lying. She's lying. 
They show us photos of Sutton and Kathy Hilton and Jennifer Tilly at social functions, having fun, laughing. Sutton and they're talking. And he goes, if I had a sister and somebody was friends with my sister and I wasn't friends with my sister, I would care, I say, I say. And Kyle's like, I'm happy for everyone to be at peace. That's between my sister and me. Sutton continues in a talking head. If she admits that she's angry with me for being friends with Kathy, that means she doesn't like Kathy, I say, I say. This is a love triangle gone awry. Meanwhile, over in the other corner, Garcelle's like, can you and I go talk to Dorit? And Dorit's like, yes. And she has like a weird smile, Dorit. And Garcelle's like, should we go outside? Oh, it's so cold. Is there a heat lamp? Crystal looks at Erica and uh, goes, well, and then there was two. And Dorit goes, congratulations tonight, Garcelle. Thank you. You should be very proud. I know you are. Seeing your name all over the place, not just starring in, but producing. Well, thank you, Dorit. I've come a long way. Yes, it's amazing. Yes, but you know, talk to me. Garcelle's like, well, I, I felt that when I shared my how I was feeling in Vegas, I felt like you took it on so much of a defensive that you weren't hearing me. And we flash back to that scene where Garcelle goes, listen, I, I don't know if I trust you guys when it comes to my family. And Dorit's like, to say that this group, all of us who are moms, I don't trust you guys are genuine when it comes to my kids and I need to protect my kids is hurtful. Garcelle goes, I mean, in the moment when I look back and saw you and Erica, and I know Erica was drunk, I know Erica was all over you. We do another flashback to Garcelle's birthday party from last year. And Garcelle, in that moment, was like, Erica, you hurt Jax's feelings. Don't talk to him like that. What? You said to get the fuck out of here, and that's not okay. Jax, come here, babe. You want to see my boobs? And Dreet's like, oh my god. Garcelle in this scene goes, but I didn't feel like you reprimanded her in the moment. I didn't see it. Back to the Erica flashback, and Erica's laying on Dorit's like, she was pushing it. Dorit's like, no, she was pushing it. Dorit in this scene goes, it just feels like our relationship moves forward, and then it feels backwards. And Garcia's like, yeah, but we were great when we were in Cannes. We had a great time. They were in Cannes for a promotional appearance for Bravo in 2022 with Andy Cohen. We see a little video of that. And Garcia goes, but I hadn't seen that meaning the reprim reprimanding of Erica at the party. It just made me feel like my kids are disregarded. You took it so hard that it made me feel like, am I crazy? All I did was share my feelings. And Dorit goes, I should have paused. I should have had a moment afterwards. And Garcelle goes, well, the thing also, you were like, it's been a year and a half. Like, aren't you over it? Um, and Garcelle's like, you said that. You said it. I take it back. And I would never say that to you, Dorit. Like, oh my God, you were robbed. You should be over it. Like, that's really insensitive. I'm very sorry, because I do very much want you to share your genuine feelings. Garcelle in the talking head goes, I like Dorit. I don't think Dorit is malicious or mean. I think sometimes Dorit is in her own head. But that's all I really wanted was her to hear me. Dorit goes, oh God, these feelings that you have. It's just like listening. And she grabs Garcelle and hugs her. What a bunch of nutters, man. Back to the first corner, Kyle's like, you know, Sutton, we can have a conversation, an adult conversation back and forth and not necessarily agree. And when you say something like, let's talk about what's going on with you and you're very obviously talking about rumors with that real clear look in your eye, that's not a friend. And then we see the headline by heavy, heavy online publication, February 14th, 2023, 11.46 p.m. Fans question Kyle Richards and Mauricio Omansky's marriage. And Sutton's like, well, I think one of the things is like you talk about you don't know who I am. It's like, OK, who is this now? I say, I say, you're just very different. And Kyle's like, mine's a physical thing. Well, the not drinking and the, you know, it's just different. You seem different than you did last year, Kyle. Sudden in the talking head goes, I'm not sure why Kyle can't confide in me or maybe anyone. One friends confide in one another. They give back to one another. Sudden in this scene goes, you just seem different. Like the exercise is excessive. And Kyle purses her lips and tilts her head back forth, stares at Sutton. Sutton continues in a talking head and goes, well, this friendship is a farce. And then they do a long pause of Sutton in the talking head, just staring. <laughs> Anyways, Kyle's like, well, I had a rough year, but I, well, I think that's fair. Well, I don't know why anybody has a problem with me. Well, I think that's a fair thing for me to say, Kyle. Maybe you can go ahead and say, you could be right here, Sutton. Kyle purses her lips and stares defiantly at her. Never going to give Sutton that pleasure. Next time on The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, we have Kyle going, people are really confused about our relationship. And we have Morgan Wade finally entering the picture. And Morgan's like, yeah. And the interviewer's like, how did you guys meet? And Morgan's like, she stalked me. She stalked me. 
And then we have a scene with Garcelle with Jax going, I always felt like you thought I should have kept the family together. And Jax, a grown man, goes, it's not like I'm hateful towards either of you for how it ended. And Garcelle's emotional is like, wow. And then a new woman, we have Anne-Marie Wiley finally entering after the sixth episode. And Chris on a talking head goes, I don't know Anna very well, but she talks a lot. That bitch is nosy. And then Denise Richards is back for this dinner. And Eric is like, are you down to eat this dinner with the THC? So it's a THC dinner. Denise looks really tipsy. And she's like, well, you know what I'm talking about. And Erica bursts out laughing like, Denise, I'm sorry. Like kind of making fun of Denise. I feel like Denise should not give these ladies ammunition like this. You got to come correct in these scenes. Anyways, Garcelle, then a scene with Garcelle going, what's with the new wedding band? And Sutton is sitting next to Cynthia Bailey. And Sutton's like, you haven't been wearing your wedding ring? Because Cynthia Bailey, you know, got a divorce last year. So that's going to be brought up. And then Anna is like, but what though? And Garcelle's like, her marriage. I mean, I guess talking about Kyle. And Kyle yells, if I'm exercising and not drinking, because guess what? Even if I have two glasses of wine, the next day I feel down and depressed. I can't afford to feel depressed right now. The table of women, including Camille Grammer, stop and stare. That's it, folks. Special thank you to Juliana Carosa for these notes. Thank you for listening. You got three long episodes back to back. We are caught up. And now we have a new episode of Salt Lake Airing tomorrow night. I'm going to go do the Patreon. If you like this podcast, uh, please rate it five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Thank you for supporting me. Good night. Bye, guys.